Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report. With Sam Cedar. <laughs> if I get the feeling you've been cheated. Here it is Tuesday, December 22nd, 2020. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five time award winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America. Downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Jeff Stein, Washington Post White House economics reporter, and Elizabeth Pancotti, policy advisor for Employ America on the COVID relief bill. What's in, what's out, and what more is desperately needed. Meanwhile, UK COVID variant, COVID variant, is up to 70% more contagious, earning them a worldwide travel restriction. Meanwhile, California hospitals contemplate COVID care rationing. Anthony Fauci predicts the majority of the country will be vaccinated by August. And Trump's bunker becoming even deeper as he lashes out at his pals. Feds are contemplating a subpoena for Giuliani's emails. And Trump weighing in on lawsuit immunity for the Saudi prince and his involvement in Khashoggi's killing. Cook County health care workers hold a one-day strike, and U.S. Postal Service Christmas delivery is crushed by COVID and the Trump administration changes. And lastly... Robert E. Lee statue is removed um, from the uh, Capitol. Much to the chagrin of PragerU. Yeah, there you go. Um, well, we will get to that. That is quite a <laughs> quite a video they put out. Uh, Emma Viglin is here uh, with me, uh, folks. Emma, how are you? I'm doing well. Uh, I'm looking forward to our little vacation and, and Christmas too, as a, a Protestant. Not really anymore, but uh, you don't have to justify. People yeah, can yeah, uh, yeah. look forward to Christmas for all sorts of reasons. Right. I'm a pagan, but I, I enjoy the, uh, there the you festivities. Go. Well, um, uh, there it is. And yesterday, of course, was the longest day of the year. So um, things are starting to lighten up around here. I've already noticed the difference. We've got uh, sundown is, I think, at a minute later than it was yesterday. And so enjoy that extra time, folks. Um, we will be doing our uh, final live show tomorrow. Uh, so uh, make sure you you, you stay with us. Um, the stimulus bill, COVID relief, passed last night, House and Senate. Um, every reason to believe uh, Donald Trump will sign it. I don't know if he's actually uh, physically signed it yet. Um, but here is uh, Rand Paul on the uh, floor of the Senate. Very, very upset. Now, look, we have a tremendous amount of data uh, that show the efficacy of giving people money who are in poverty. We have a tremendous amount of data from uh, data from just uh, the CARES Act back in March, the implications of giving people money when not just when they've lost their job, but when they are everybody was shut down for a month. Um, you've got rents building up helps take uh, people out of poverty. We had, I think, our lowest, one of our lowest periods of poverty uh, in the months following the increase in unemployment insurance, federal augmentation, I guess, of that insurance, and also these direct payments. Uh, so we know it works. 
grand Republicans saw that as a problem because maybe they're getting twenty dollars more a week than they normally would at their job that pays them a starvation wage. Right. I mean, the idea that they're getting pulled out of poverty, that could be a problem that could actually give people who are working a little bit more bargaining power when it comes to dealing with their employers. Uh, Here is Rand Paul on the on the floor of the Senate talking in very religious terms about uh, helping people out during this time. The senator from Kentucky. Republicans like to mock modern monetary theory, the idea that government can print money with impunity, that government can spend whatever it wants without the need to tax. Modern monetary theory is basically the Dick Cheney deficits don't matter crowd trussed up with a new fancy title. Most Republicans rightly lampoon this quackery, that is, when they're not practicing the quackery themselves. Today, many of these same Republicans will vote for a bill that makes modern monetary theory look like child's play in comparison. The monster spending bill presented today is not just a deficits don't matter disaster, it is everything Republicans say they don't believe in. This bill is free money for everyone. Proponents don't care if you're fully employed or own your own house or own your own business. Free money for everyone, they cry. And yet, if free money were the answer, if money really grew on trees, why not give more free money? Why not give it out all the time? Why stop at $600 a person? Why not $1,000? Why not $2,000? Maybe these new free money Republicans should join the Everybody Gets a Guaranteed Income Caucus. Why not $20,000 a year for everybody? Why not $30,000? If we can print up money with impunity, why not do it? The Treasury can just keep printing the money. That is, until someone points out that the emperor has no clothes and that the dollar no longer has value. To so-called conservatives who are quick to identify the socialism of Democrats, if you vote for this spending monstrosity, you are no better. When you vote to pass out free money, you lose your soul and you abandon forever any semblance of moral or fiscal integrity. So the next time you see Republicans... Wow. You lose your soul. I mean, I guess Jesus, who said that it's uh, it's harder for a, a rich man to get into heaven than for a camel to pass through the eye of the needle. I guess he was a soulless monster himself. I, I mean, I don't know about that. I'm not. Uh, I haven't spent that much time studying my my uh, late antiquity. Uh, but uh, the idea that you lose your soul uh, and your 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 integrity if you provide. Uh, first off, let's just talk because there's so much here that is. Um, um, sort of stunning for him to say. This is a guy, uh, you recall the tax cuts that were passed under the uh, Trump administration. Um, the Republicans in both houses passed tax cuts in 2017, creating a massive uh, deficit, massive, uh, nearly a, you know, it was $700 billion, I think it was. And these are tax cuts that particularly now that we're a couple years out are primarily geared towards uh, the very, very wealthy in this country. Apparently, deficits don't matter to him, who is religious about this and moral about this, when it's a question of giving free money, because that's what you're doing. There's a certain amount of dues it takes from everyone in society to function this club we have called society or America. And when you are forgiven those dues, you are basically offloading those expenses to someone else. And that's what those tax cuts are. They are free services in kind for wealthy people. But you don't understand, Sam, there's a cognitive dissonance that Republicans can fall back on, that it's not exactly giving money to people when they're desperate. They can say, oh, we're just diverting those funds or, or we're just ta- c- cutting taxes, right? Even though it's essentially exactly what you're saying, giving money back to wealthy people. It's just not the direct cash payments right into their bank account. It's, as far as the U.S. government is concerned, it's the exact same thing. It's just a, it's just a number on a ledger. And the reality is, is that 
money does not grow on trees. It actually can be produced much, much quicker. It was done during the financial crisis. It was done now. We can actually give people, and I think there's, you know, he raises a good question. Why not give more money to people, even in times where there's not a crisis? We could give people more money. We could give people more uh, basic services. We could decommodify things like health care. We can, in fact, do this. And he doesn't really talk about the consequences. All he talks about is quackery. And when you talk about quackery, you can look back at all the talk about uh, quantitative easing one and QE2 and QE3 back in 2009, 2010. And all we heard was that we're going to turn into this hyperinflation like Weimar Republic. And the fact of the matter is, is that the dollar is not pegged to gold anymore, that there's no reason to believe that the dollar I print tomorrow has any less value than the dollar I print today. Uh, that if I print $2 tomorrow, it has any less value than it, the $1 or $2 I print today. And there's an easy ability by the Fed and by our federal government to control inflation if the economy overheats. But that's not our problem right now. Certainly not our problem. You can right do now. that by taxation. You can do that by tightening the money supply. There's, a, there's, there's many arrows in that quiver. But uh, Rand Paul talking about financial quackery or any type of quackery is well, in and of itself a hoot. On, on his religious ideology of libertarianism, where you can feel like a moral person without actually governing morally, uh, just because you have a strict ideology, as opposed to just taking situations as they are and realizing my job as a senator is to make lives better for Americans, not just act like a college sophomore who's been learning and reading about specific books and applying them directly to my uh, governing philosophy. We will uh, we'll talk to Jeff Stein and uh, Elizabeth Pancotti in just a moment uh, about what is what has been uh, included in this package and what's been left out. In the meantime, uh, this program is uh, brought to you today by Sunset Lake CBD. Check out sunsetlakecbd.com. Uh, it is, uh, this is a great company. They're fans of the show. They have been, uh, uh, uh promoting their, their stuff on this program, uh, basically throughout 2020. Great business practices, $15 minimum wage, mostly employee owned company. They practice regenerative farming practices, with the help of the university of Vermont. They're located up near Burlington. They were farmed, started out uh, as a dairy farm providing, uh, milk for Ben and Jerry's ice cream. They still do. Uh, they decided to diversify 100% pesticide free, organic fertilizer. Um, and their products are awesome. Matt is a big fan of the smalls. I'm a big fan of the tincture helps me get to sleep and the salve as it were that, uh, it's good for your muscles. I find it good for some, uh, my dry skin, frankly. Um, I'm sure your dry skin is needing some of the solve right oh now. Oh my gosh. Yes, constantly. Yeah. And uh, gummy bears, they have uh, CBD infused coffee. Check it out, folks. And right now, if you head over there, there's a sale going on. Usually it's the uh, left is best uh, promo code, but right now you can get 25% off with promo code GIFT25. You get a free 125 milligram salve if you order $75 or more. You get a free 750 milligram tincture if you order $100 or more. And you can get both items free if you order $125 or more. Check it out, sunsetlakecbd.com. Also, don't forget, this program is supported by our members. You can become a member at jointhemajorityreport.com. Don't forget to check out uh, Nomi's show, uh, youtube.com, The Nomi Key Show. And... Um, <laughs> All right. With us now, hopefully, we have uh, Jeff Stein. He is the Washington Post White House economics reporter. And there he is. He's hey, Sam. What's going on? Jeff, how you doing? Hey, Sam. I'm good. Can you hear me all right? <laughs> yes, we can hear you pretty well. Um, Emma's here with us. Um, we can see you. We can see your hand. It's huge. Um, and uh, appreciate your joining us. All right, so let's go through. Um, we're going to be talking to Elizabeth Pancotti about uh, some of the unemployment um, uh, features and the pandemic uh, 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 unemployment assistance. Um, but give us a, a sense of, broadly speaking, what is in this $900 billion uh, uh, package? 
But if, let me just start with this question. Originally, we heard $900 billion, and about $180 billion was sequestered in a second package that was ostensibly going to be two bills, right? At one point, it had been broken off into two bills where the uh, corporate liability and the, and the city and state funding were going to be put aside. Where did, how did that difference between that money come into this $900 billion bill? Because all of a sudden it went from like seven twenty to $900 billion. What it, what, Where does this money broadly break down? Okay, so um, really good question. I, I know it's probably insane to try to follow this. Um, like it's my full-time job and all I've been thinking about for months and I still get confused. So I understand for most people, it's just probably intractable. Um, you know, the big picture, what's in the bill, I think the most easy way to think about it is sort of like three big buckets. And the first big bucket is like $330 billion for small business aid. The second big bucket, smaller, but the second substantial one is unemployment insurance, about $150 billion for that, and a similar amount for the second round of stimulus payments. And then you have like a dozen substantially smaller buckets that break down rental assistance, um, hunger assistance, money for schools, money for vaccine distributions. Those are like ballparking here, but like 50 billion or so. Um, and those go down the list like that. Your question is sort of about like the sequencing of how, you know, at the beginning of this month, Joe Manchin and Mitt Romney came out with a $900 billion proposal. It included $200 billion in state aid. Then that appeared to fall out of the package. So it looked like, why couldn't they just, you know, put a, you know, a large number of that, you know, put, put stimulus checks instead of the state aid, and then, you know, the package would be all ready to go. But in the final version, unemployment benefits and stimulus checks were much smaller than they could have been if you had just said, take out the state aid, keep unemployment the same, and put stimulus checks on top. And so what you're picking up on very perceptively, I think, um, is that the size of the small business portion, the pot that went to business aid, and some people will say not just small businesses, but you know, sometimes large businesses, that pot continued to grow. And so when you accepted the Republican framework of $900 billion being the maximum amount that could be spent, it meant that every dollar that was increased for small business aid meant that the amount of money available for other priorities would shrink. And so as a result, we saw some pretty important limits on both the stimulus checks. Not only are they only $600 per person instead of $1,200, they also exclude adult dependents. They, you know, this is a huge population of 135 a uh, million people, according to Matt Bruning of the People's Policy Project, will be shut out of stimulus payments because of that. That's oh. a lot of students and disabled people who are going to be deprived of, of checks. And there are huge limits on the unemployment provisions as well. Um, a lot of people are expecting the vaccine distribution to not really um, begin in earnest until the summer. The unemployment provisions in this bill expire in 11 weeks. That's mid-March. So a lot of people are going to be thrown off of unemployment benefits really way before the labor market is safe to return to at normal normal levels. But um, hopefully that answers some of your questions a little no, bit. You no, know, that does. I mean, basically what happened is that $180 billion uh, went more into the PPP than in other areas is what, I, what I'm hearing you say. And let me ask you this, if that's the case. My understanding, there were two tranches of the PPP. This is the Paycheck Protection Program. This is just to remind people, it was a loan from the U.S. government to small businesses and I put that in quotes because there's been some uh, significant controversy about some of the people who have gotten it. Uh, and you had, I think it was eight to 10 weeks of payroll that you could pay. And maybe I think also including rent. And if you showed the government that you spent that money on payroll over those eight to 10 weeks, you would basically be granted that money after the fact. But wasn't there in the second tranche of PPP, by the time they were done, wasn't there like $130 billion left over? Like they didn't even exhaust that. And it seems to me if you're a business that could get through, I don't know, whatever, 10 weeks out from March or April, if you could get through July of 2020, that you're in business and you're in business. <laughs> like it's you've made it work. There, where was the need? What was the theory behind the need for this? Other than just like, we're giving out money, let's give it to small business owners who don't necessarily need it. And that encourages people to go back to work in a situation where, you know, we need like a couple of months to get past this. Yeah, so, so really good questions. Um, I think 
one thing to keep in mind in terms of you're identifying correctly the fact that there were about you know 150 billion dollars in money for PPP that was just sort of sitting around and for months people were like why don't they do something with this extra cash people are suffering desperately and it's just sitting in some treasury accounts somewhere not getting spent and the reason they couldn't just get that money out and the reason they're still approving new PPP money even though it seems like the funds were exhausted and they were exhausted is because people only qual- businesses only qualified for one round of PPP funding. But then once that was up, they weren't able to reapply for the extra remaining funds. So what Congress is doing now is saying, okay, you're a restaurant, you've been hit really hard, you, um, you know, got your first round of PPP money, we have all this extra money left over. Initially, you couldn't apply for that because you know, it was just the first tranche. But now that you're into, you were into the winter, it's months later, now that Congress is passing a bill, you'll be able to apply for a second round of PPP funding. And then to your question of why are we doing this, um, I think there's, there's uh, the defense that people on the Hill would give you who are involved in this will say, you know, when we first rushed it out, we were trying to minimize documentation um, as much as possible because there was just such a need to just say, let's just get the money out as much as possible. We understand that there's going to be waste here and that's the price we're willing to pay. But this time around, um, they're actually, they're including pretty strict um, revenue decline um, verification that businesses are going to have to show, unlike last time, that they've taken a large economic hit, that the revenue, I think, is down. Initially, it was supposed to be 33%, and then enough business lobbyists were complaining that they lowered it to 25%. You have to demonstrate a 25% revenue decline to qualify for PPP funding this time. And I think the other argument that that defenders of of, of this decision would make is that, you know, look, um, the unemployment systems are a complete mess. And for 30 years, uh, America has done a very bad job maintaining its infrastructure for dispersing uh, benefits to jobless Americans. And as a result, you know, we actually have a better system of getting this money to people. Even if people stay at home, they can technically be on payroll and not have to go through, you know, what I've talked to many, many, many people. It's just the absolute nightmare of applying for unemployment benefits and these completely overwhelmed state systems. Um, on the other hand, you know, you talk to you know Bernie Sanders' office, people who support you know Senator Sanders, and they say, look, you guys continue to scale back unemployment benefits in the final bill. The checks are really not as generous, and yet the PPP money continue to grow. This is a this is a huge mistake. We could have sent bigger rounds of checks that would have gotten to people very quickly, and the business lobby is just too powerful, and that's the reason that 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 money you know continue to grow. So of the 400 and what, $29 billion that was left over from the CARES Act that is being applied to this $900 billion portion um, of the aid, you know, if the liability shield and um, and state and local aid ends up being passed, um, how much of that is the $130 billion that you're talking about that was just sitting in that treasury fund? And then how much of it, what comprises the rest of that money? So this is another really good question. I feel like people are very confused about. So maybe I'll try probably ineffectually to bring uh, clarity to Twitter and elsewhere. I, you know, I think what's what's important to keep in mind is that the PPP money that was left over is separate from the. Sorry, did I lose you for a second. Yeah, we got um, you. What, what I was trying to say is the PPP money that's left over is separate from the um, exchange stabilization fund money that is the 429 you're referring to. The PPP money was really direct grants uh, in funding left over. And that was, I don't remember the exact number, but 150 billion, something like that, that that had been, you know, was still unappropriated. There's a separate pot of money. I know this gets so boring and people's eyes glaze over, but the the second pot of money was provided. This was a lot of the talk about the sort of corporate slush fund bailout fund for Treasury Secretary Stephen Mnuchin. That was capital that was supposed to be used to then give out loans from liquidity markets um, for ailing you know, governments, for ailing businesses. That money, you know, most of that funding was not really used at all, um, but it's a totally different pot of business aid than the PPP. Um, and it's also worth keeping in mind that this money, it, it's, it's a little complicated, but it's not just like traditional cash sitting around. It's really capital reserves that are, were intended never to really be spent, but to form sort of the, the principle that on which Treasury and the Fed would then make loans in excess of you know, trillions of dollars. But it's, it's not the same thing as just having like $100 billion in PPP money sitting around and waiting to be spent. In fact, CBO is still likely to count that money being reappropriated here as new spending, even though 
Republicans wanted to be able to tell their base and their caucus, like, hey, this isn't really new money because it's just sitting around. I mean, that's kind of true, but they have a clear incentive to make the bill looks, you know, the Republican leadership that wanted to do something, they won't need to tell their right flank, hey, this bill is not as big as the Democrats are making it seem to be. And so they're sort of downplaying, um, you know, that as new spending, even though I think, you know, most of the economists and likely like the actual budget nerds will like count it as new spending. Yeah. Now I should just say, um, uh, sadly, we're not one of those places that get bored with this conversation about that <laughs> Fed capital reserve. Now, just to be clear, this is one of the things that people were complaining about, uh, at least on the left, with the CARES Act was this five hundred billion dollars, which was used as essentially, um, uh, uh, you know, a backstop to trillions of dollars worth of loans that were going out to corporations. Um, and uh, more or less free money for corporations alone. But again, if you give me a, a, a billion dollars for free and say, I don't have to pay you back in uh, for a year, I'm going to be very happy with that because I can go out and I can find two or three percent. No, in- the, the average American does not have access to a zero percent loan from the federal government in right away. Exactly. And now, ostensibly, this was also supposed to backstop municipal and state loans as well, or bonds. Um, how, how much of that still remains? Because at one point, Mnuchin was talking about pulling that back. And I know that was a late attempt by uh, some Republicans to pull that money back, particularly to provide it for, uh, for bonds for, for, for state and, and, and local uh, municipal um, uh, entities. My understanding is that that was not that was underused, but I imagine going forward, we may see more use out of that as things get more dire. I think uh, and again, I'm not a I'm not a Fed reporter, but my strong understanding is that, you know, under Janet Yellen, the Biden administration and you know Jerome Powell working with with the Biden administration could get much more aggressive about, um, you know, low interest loans to state and local governments that could help them out. And the fact that you know, the money you were talking about was returned does not mean that um, Treasury and the Fed are out of capital um, to extend these kinds of loans. There's still very much money in those accounts that they can use. And that's why the late push from Senator Pat Toomey to rein in, um, you know, exactly what they could do in terms of these municipal lending facilities proves such a sticking point. Uh, as, as we mentioned, state and local aid fell out of the bill, right? So all of these states and cities that are that have laid off, I think the number is over a million um, public sector workers over the last, um, you know, since the recession, since the pandemic began, they're looking at this bill and saying, this is this is a huge problem. And I think, you know, I was talking to a Democrat recently who was making the point, like, look, we have all this PPP money, and that's going to keep all these people in the private sector employed. But if you're a public sector employee, there really isn't as much in this bill for you if you work for a state or city. And so there's going to be a lot of pressure on the Biden team to say, how can we get creative with these federal, you know, what the money that's still left in the Federal Reserve account, in the Treasury accounts, and that could be lent through the Federal Reserve? Um, you know, the the flip side that people are going to make and the pressure they're going to get from the other end of this is, you know, if you give a low interest federal loan to a, a small business or a state or city that, that misuses it, that misspends the money, that... Um, maybe mismanage their funding before that's going to become, you know, whatever Solyndra, you know, that Democrats get nervous about because when the government gives out money, like it, it can be wasted or, or misused. Um, you know, you sometimes see this in the press about, you know, stimulus checks that were, that were misspent or, or whatever that, um, I mean, I, I sometimes wonder about that reporting and, and that criticism because, you know, nobody says, Hey, you know, grandpa used, Social Security on 75 lotto tickets this month. Like, that is not something we typically criticize Social Security uh, recipients for. But anyway, a long winded answer, but it'll be definitely interesting to watch what they do with um, the money and how they could help state and local governments on their own. All right, let's just, I I just want to just, uh, I want to put a fine point on this because the lack, I mean, the idea that we've lost a million jobs in state, um, in, in government workers and I don't even know that we're even close to what it could be six months from now. You just put into context the implications of that because my understanding is, and it's been a while since I looked at these charts, but if you go back and look at the recoveries from the Clinton, from the Reagan, Clinton, and um, 
uh, uh, Bush, Bush two uh, recessions, that the 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 way that we got out of that recession was to actually increase spending on government uh, employees and basically across the board. I'm talking municipal, state, and federal. And when we didn't do that under the Obama administration, we all know that we had an incredibly anemic recovery that took almost a decade, really, um, uh, to come back. Give us put that in context for us. How important? the state and municipal um, funding is? It's a great question. Um, I think the optimistic reading of this is that this is not a traditional business cycle shock in which, you know, you know what we saw in the Great Recession or the Great Depression or traditional recessions where, you know, um, investors get skittish and you see a sort of slow moving decline in savings, consumption, spending. This is actually a recession in which we've seen a massive increase in savings. Americans' uh, saving rates is at an all-time high, I think in American history still at this point. Um, and the, the optimistic reading is that when the vaccine arrives, um, this is, I think, the, the optimistic reading for the bill overall, that what we're really looking for is just trying to get us through the next few months, and that once the vaccine is widely distributed, people who have been saving, who put away some of their stimulus check money, who you know, haven't been commuting to work. Um, the savings rate is really high right now. Obviously, tremendous, tremendous, tremendous suffering, tens of millions of people in dire straits. But for many, many middle and upper middle class Americans, they, they are putting more money away. And that's, you know, one of the reasons we've seen such widening inequality. But if the vaccine arrives and that money pours back into the economy, then the fact that state and local governments are hemorrhaging some money is not going to be you know, it's not the traditional story that you're alluding to, which is a, a, important to keep in mind for sure. Um, the other component of this is that, you know, I, I think, you know, I talked to a lot of uh, mayors uh, last week who were really, really upset about just feeling betrayed by the Democrats over this. And, and I, I understand, you know, why, why they say that. The thing that they'll also say is that this bill is still a lot better for them than nothing passing. And if their constituents have another stimulus check, um, if their transportation agencies have more money, there's there's over $50 billion, I think it was, uh, in the final bill for transportation authorities, you know, uh, the WMATA, the uh, MTA in New York City, New Orleans is going to get some help. I mean, there are there is targeted help here for renters. Um, and certainly compared to nothing, uh, the states and cities are going to be better off under this bill than they otherwise would be financially. Yes, compared to nothing, compared to... <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I, I mean, I guess, you know, I mean, yeah, that's true. And the va and a vaccine coming in two years would be better than a vaccine never coming at all. But we're going to have, you know, uh, when the, we all get vaccinated is going to have direct implications as to how many people live or die. And uh, and so this is. Uh, but yes, I, I something is sometimes better than nothing, although sometimes that lets the air out of the tire and you don't get as much later which, uh, you know, that may be operative as well. Jeff Stein, Washington Post, thanks so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thanks so hey, much. Hey, pleasure being on. Happy to be on whenever you guys need me. Thanks so much. All right. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to be talking to Elizabeth Pancotti. She is the policy advisor for Employ America. Okay, I'd like to welcome to the program uh, Elizabeth Pancotti. She is a uh, policy advisor for Employ America. Elizabeth, uh, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, so let's, you, you obviously focus on, on, on workers. Um, let's go through some of the, the top line numbers, and then we'll, we'll, we'll get into um, uh, some of the sort of, I guess, uh, more narrow questions of of the bill, we have two different types of unemployment essentially in this, right? We have we have sort of like a, a temporal extension and a uh, I guess a financial augmentation. Yeah, I think that's right. So there's an extension of some of the federal programs that give workers an additional 11 weeks of benefits on top of either their state benefits or their other federal benefits. And then just like we had from April through July, there's a top off to those benefits. So they'll get an extra $300 added to their checks for those 11 weeks. So give us a sense of like, all right, if, if um, what, what happens if my unemployment runs out 
on the 26th, right? We have millions of Americans whose unemployment benefits run out. Are all those people extended? What, what, uh, give us a sense of, 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 of how that works. Yeah, so the, the like pipeline here is a little messy and a lot of it will depend on regulations. But what we know so far is that there are currently four types of programs you could be on. The first is that you're on state unemployment benefits and that means you came on likely within the last 26 weeks and you will stay on your state unemployment benefits until you exhaust and then you will move on to a new program. So those people, they should be fine. They don't have to worry about anything. In a couple of weeks, they'll start to see $300 checks added on. Uh, we imagine that they won't be, so they should, they get started, they start to add on as of next week, but they probably won't see them on their checks next week. So they'll get a lump sum payment for that back pay. Okay. The second program they could be on is the PEUC program that was extended by this bill was set to expire Saturday. And that gives you 13, now 24 weeks after your state benefits. That program, uh, if people were on it, right, if they're on it right now, they will be extended on it. However, a lot of states, because of the timing of this bill, they had already set that to expire and they would have moved workers on to another program called the Extended Benefits Program if they're like if their state is triggered on. So not all states have EB right now. And so for those people, it's possible they'll have a temporary lapse in payments or that they'll be temporarily moved on to another program just in this like interim period while we set up the policies of this new bill. The third program is the EB program and 24 states are currently triggered on to that program. And that gives workers between six and 20 weeks of additional benefits after their state benefits and PEUC. The problem, however, is in this bill, they, if workers were on state and then they exhausted PEUC, those 13 uh, initial weeks from CARES, and then they went on to the extended benefits program, they have to clear out all of their extended benefits weeks before they can go to these new 11 weeks. Now, the big problem with that is that if you get 20 weeks of extended benefits and you use those 20 weeks over the next 11 weeks, you're not actually going to be able to claim the new PEUC weeks. And so what would have been better is to allow workers to go back onto PEUC. It's kind of a use it or lose it situation for like your PTO at work, right? If you don't use it in the time that you have to use it, you don't get those weeks. And so it's the same situation. The last potential program you could be on is called PUA. And that's that program built for kind of uh, independent contractors, gig workers, or people who aren't eligible for UI traditionally. And so that program was extended also by 11 weeks. And those people uh, additionally might face this kind of lapse in payments where over the weekend, many programs were set up to kind of expire because that was what the bill tech said and we passed a bill at the very last minute. And so it's likely that those people will lose benefits for a few weeks and then be brought back on and get back pay for those weeks. So that's kind of where we stand for the four different types. Uh, Elizabeth, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I imagine you uh, you study other uh, countries' unemployment uh, systems. How compl- I mean, I'm just sitting here, like, listen to you explain this, and um, and and thank you for being able to uh, walk us through this. But it sounds insane the way that we <laughs> set up. I mean, like, honestly, like if I was going to sit into a laboratory and try and figure out what can I make the most complicated Byzantine system and make it like, and 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 really make people pay essentially, for the benefits, the unemployment benefits that they're getting. Like really make them, you know, just make it as painful as possible. This is what I would do. I mean, it (laughs) sounds insane to me. Yeah, I mean, so I think the big problem is partially that there are 53 separate systems of unemployment insurance. We've got all state systems, you know, D.C., Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands. And so there are all of these different state systems that have different rules, different regulations, different enforcement of all these things, different benefit amounts, different eligibility. And on top of that, you have these new federal requirements and new federal programs that get implemented at the very last minute where we don't have time to implement them because we've defunded state UI offices. Like it's truly a terribly designed system and an intentionally terribly designed system. Like, you know, if we look at other welfare programs, it's incredibly hard in the United States to access these programs. Like none of these kind of barriers are accidental. And even in this bill, we see that. So now uh, a new thing was introduced in this bill for program integrity. And that is that PUA recipients of pandemic unemployment assistance, those like gig workers and people that aren't eligible for state UI, they will now be required to provide documentation for why they're eligible for PUA. And previously they could attest under the threat of perjury that they were eligible for X reasons. And then they would receive a bit of a benefit. And then if they provided income documentation, they could get a bit more, you know, they could contest for more money. And now they will be required to provide some sort of documentation for a COVID diagnosis, for their kids' school closures, for uh, needing to isolate because they have asthma or pre-existing condition, all of these different things. 
so far we haven't seen, we'll need guidance from the Department of Labor to know exactly what they'll need to submit for those. But I mean, this language like came from, you know, conservative offices that in the name of program integrity wanted to kind of create barriers for these workers. And as you said, like if we went into a laboratory and said, what are all the bad things we can do? We have done a lot of them. Uh, Emma's mic is not. All right, Sam, you're muted. Don't know how that happened. Go okay. ahead, Emma. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. And additionally, I remember reading some things at the beginning of the pandemic um, about how state unemployment offices, some of them were still um, in the red or were uh, ha had very little money to provide for people. So that's why the federal assistance was so needed. But you have uh, state unemployment offices who are lacking funding, lacking money, and then also red state unemployment offices where they've basically been gutted entirely. So can you talk about the extra complications um, when it comes to some of those red states and some of those unemployment offices that are in, in dire straits financially and were so even before the pandemic began? Yeah, so I mean, the the last few states that had loans for their, so basically what happens is employers pay taxes on their employees' wages into the UI system, and then they're distributed through the UI system. And so uh, in times of great unemployment, there are, the federal government issues loans to states so that they can pay out these benefits. And in the Great Recession, I think like 29 states had taken out loans uh, for to pay out these benefits. And, and up until a year ago, there were still a couple of states still paying off those loans and many were not meeting federal requirements for solvency or the kind of minimum balances required in those funds. This is also coming, you know, between 2010 and 2019, many states scaled back the benefits that they provide. They scaled back the eligibility for these programs. I mean, they truly do make it very hard. Uh, they make it an inaccessible program and a kind of, you know, not as beneficial program as it could be. The average UI uh, benefit amount is about $375 and it replaces 30 to 40% of folks' income. And so, you know, this was, these are all intentional design pro programs. In the OECD countries, we have the lowest income replacement rate. And in fact, we uh, we replace 0% of income after six months because states only offer up to 26 weeks in most cases. And so, you know, I think in terms of financing right now, there are about $45 billion in outstanding trust fund loans that have been taken out since March by 22 states and, and DC. Uh, I, you know, there's no way these states are going to be able to pay back these loans and there are penalties for failing to pay back. They're not interest-free loans. And so, you know, we're, we're charging states even more money when I think you guys were just talking about to Jeff about how in the whole state budgets are. Um, these also, you know, these loans count against balanced budget laws in some states, uh, you know, and I think we'll see what happened in the aftermath of the Great Recession where states turn to austerity and they cut social services and they cut jobs because they don't have any money to spend. And it only benefit, you know, it, it only, it doesn't benefit anyone. Like it only harms workers and their families, especially with families. Are struggling. I mean, that's part of the, that's part of the, the issue um, regarding the lack of funding for states and municipalities now is that you can say once the vaccine comes, we're going to have an explosion of economic activity and revenues are going to be back. But um, that's a real problem going forward because they're getting in the hole with these interest bearing loans. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they, these loans are not easy to pay back for many states in the Great Recession. They took five, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years to pay back. Uh, in this bill, there was no discussion of forgiving those loans or providing any kind of additional federal funding to the benefits. Um, this pop off is thankfully going to help a lot of workers, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't replace income after it ends. And it, you know, there's no, it's an 11 week extension, right? There was no kind of fight for this to be in place until the unemployment rate goes down or until there aren't 20 million people claiming unemployment. I think we're getting a little bit of static uh, from your uh, computer fan, I think. It's, oh, it's, no. Yeah, is that it? Sitting, you're sitting on a stack of books. Oh, I understand. Uh, <laughs> there, Oh, that seemed, I just hit mute and then unmuted and it seemed to have helped. Yeah, that helped a little bit. So, uh, uh, so all right, well, l let me ask you about this because, I mean, it, it is, it's, it's stunning that we have such a, uh, a low replacement figure for employment uh, payments, uh, but it's even more stunning when you contemplate the idea that we want to encourage people to stay at home during a pandemic. And, uh, one of the things that was pulled out of the bill, bill was that employers will no longer have to provide paid sick leave to workers who get infected with COVID-19. 
Will you talk about this? Because this is just amazing. It just sounds insane to me. I mean, first off, we should have mandatory paid sick leave just in general. <laughs> but during a highly contagious epidemic, I would imagine this is like the first thing that you would want. Yeah, no, I mean, it is the first thing we would want. There was a big fight that this was not, I mean, this was not included. Uh, we, we, any, in any summaries we saw of the previous kind of mansion Romney proposal, it wasn't included. Now it's included as a tax extender. And so businesses, if they offer paid leave, will be credited for that via taxes the same way that it was in CARES, except in CARES and in um, the second bill, Families First. You uh, were you had to offer this program, and now it's you know if you want to offer it, we'll pay for it. Um, I would imagine many businesses can't afford to go without workers when half of their workforce is out with COVID, and you know that's not a, a great thing. And so you know I think yeah you're right to say that in uh you know in the 21st century we should just have paid leave. There are five states that have it, and in the rest of them, you know workers are left without any benefits in many cases. In addition, you know. Uh, we don't have universal health care. And so folks are right now foregoing medical treatment, as, you know, including COVID treatment, because they can't afford to get it. And when you have 20 million people out of jobs, and when your insurance is tied to your employment, it's very likely that, you know, I, I know when we get the figures for insurance rates this year, it's going to be really bad. And I don't know how you would afford, you know, if you're not eligible for Medicaid, I don't know how you would afford like an Obamacare program, uh, or, a, you know, a, a private insurance exchange um, program, where you could be in, covered by insurance after you lost your job on unemployment, that's you know three hundred dollars a week. So I think it's it's like a two part issue. Like this is one a public health crisis and two an economic crisis, and they're very intertwined. And somehow every policy we have and every policy response we have just comes up short in failing to um, you know provide for both of those issues. And we should say even in the best case scenario, uh, and I, I, I'm I'm saying that half facetiously, you lose your job. You're not eligible. It's not like you can go immediately on Medicaid, right? Like Because the numbers that they're looking at are backward-looking numbers, not forward-looking numbers. So if I'm out of work and I'm out of unemployment, and I'm looking forward and I have no income coming in, I'm still not eligible for Medicaid until that period of time is in my rearview mirror. And so we're going to have these huge gaps where people are not getting covered. Um, so what else? Is there anything else in the bill or anything else that is absent from the bill that you think is absolutely crucial uh, to know about? And maybe one that in the event, I mean, there's talk that Biden is going to go for a second bite at this apple later. I don't know under, under you know, uh, you know what will have to happen to Mitch McConnell for that to happen. But uh, let's just assume maybe there's a chance that uh, the Democrats win in Georgia. What, what is, sticks out as you look at this, uh, advocating for workers, uh, what, what sticks out? for you in this bill? Okay, so I'll say three things that I think we have to fix and then one thing that's really good. I'll start with the good news. So the SNAP and the nutrition assistance uh, benefits in this bill, actually there's two. So SNAP and nutrition benefits in this bill are amazing. Uh, there's a huge increase, especially for households with children. Um, and given that you know school closures are happening again, we're heading into the holidays where kids aren't going to school, that's gonna be a really big help to households with children when we know, you know one in five households with kids can't put enough food on the table. And so that I think, you know, the SNAP provisions of this bill really will help workers and their families, especially, you know, those on, on unemployment insurance. Let the me second, one caveat to that. Because yes. my understanding is that there's a ton of money sitting at the USDA that has not been delivered to folks, to those kids in particular, who have not been getting their lunches in schools, yes. that they have not gotten the funds. Uh, so the funds have been allocated, but uh, because of the nature of the administration we have now, that really does not have very much interest in government functioning, the money's not reaching the people it's supposed to. That's true. We do have a new U.S. Department of Agriculture secretary on his way. And so I would hope that that's, you know, a day one priority. You know, I think there are going to be legislative priorities for the Biden administration and administration, uh, administrative priorities that should be, you know, on the top of the list for administrative. The second good thing in the bill is that it includes $25 billion for rental assistance. We know that one in six renters are behind in rent by thousands of dollars. And so, you know, working with local housing agencies, states and, and the federal government are really going to inject money into, into that. 
And, you know, I can't imagine, you know, the eviction moratorium is only extended to January 31st. I don't know how you would back pay $5,000 in rent by the end of January when you're making $200 a week in UI. And so that I think is another bright spot of the bill. I guess the, the one is too, is that we didn't include liability shields for corporations. And that's a huge thing. You know, McConnell had been very insistent. Republicans had been very ins insistent about stripping even the like small fines that OSHA is able to give out for the past several months and to pass a huge stimulus package, even if uh, not as big as we need or not as big as we would have liked that that not being in the bill, I think is is monumental. The three things I think we need to fix are, uh, you know, there are a couple of technical provisions in the UI part that I think had, you know, had we not been negotiating with, you know, McConnell and people like Chuck Grassley and whatnot, like those wouldn't have made it into the bill. And so if there was room to make those technical uh you know, those technical adjustments, I think that'd be a big thing. Um, you know, Senator Wyden had a really, really great UI bill come out, I think two or three weeks ago that would have included all of those technical fixes and would have really expanded access and integrity in the program. And I think for workers. And so I think, you know, focus, if we could just take the Wyden text and make it into a bill, that'd be great. Senator Warner also fought really hard for those provisions and they didn't make it into the bill. And so I think more work there is needed. The second thing is that we extended these programs for 11 weeks. We extended an eviction moratorium for one month. Like none of these timelines are sufficient, nor do they really even get us through like the installment of the new administration, given that we're gonna spend all of January and February on hearings. And so I think, yeah, I think Employee America has been shouting about this and all the nerds have been shouting about this, but if we stop tying arbitrary end dates to these policies and said they will be in place until the unemployment rate falls or until workers no longer need them or until renters no longer need them or until state and local governments no longer need them, that I think is a big thing that, you know, we should just say until the unemployment rate is back where it was before February, provide enhanced unemployment insurance. The last thing is the language around the Federal Reserve lending facilities that I think you and Jeff touched on before I was on. And, you know, Senator Toomey fought really hard to end these lending facilities. He did say in a statement, and so did Secretary Mnuchin, say, they said that, you know, Janet Yellen and, and Chairman Powell could come back to Congress and say, we need these facilities and we need backstops for them. And, you know, you need to provide funding and authority for us to lend to state and local governments and, you know, to corporations that employ people. Uh, unfortunately, you know, that those programs, those lending facilities were designed in such a way that many, you know, municipalities and state and local governments and, you know, all sorts of people couldn't use them effectively. And as a result, we're either going into, you know, either cutting spending or going into a kind of private market debt where a Federal Reserve lending facility could have helped them. Um, and we could have kept workers on payroll. We could have kept state and local governments in check. And so those, you know, were designed with Secretary Mnuchin to really exclude the kind of power that they could have had. Uh, unfortunately, the language in this bill really does limit the 13-3 lending facility um, powers of the Fed, especially for emergency facilities. And so I think revisiting that and trying to, you know, inject uh, what we can into creating effective lending facilities at the Federal Reserve would probably be a good place to start, too. All right. Good. Just quickly, I just want to go over those last two. Um, the automatic stabilizers you were talking about, which is basically saying instead of uh, an arbitrary cutoff, eight weeks, 11 weeks or whatever, we benchmark it against the success of the economy, essentially, yeah. it, as measured by how many people are working, how many people are, you know, need food assistance, whatever it is in terms of we benchmark it based upon the needs of the American public. This is something that was uh, people were highly critical of the Democrats for not pushing more in the original CARES Act because that was the last time that there was a lot of uh, leverage. And, this, and the second point, uh, and, and you need a legislative fix for that, we should say. Right? Like that, that's not something that the administration can extend uh, unilaterally through existing statutory authority. Uh, although I would imagine there's some play in some of that, uh, but I, I, don't, I don't know. But, I think when end dates are codified into legislation, you don't have a lot of room in regs to change them. Okay, fair enough. And then in terms of the lending facilities, do you need a legislative fix for that? Or is there authority that the Fed has so they could unilaterally extend some of these lending facilities for states and cities? Uh, so I think that will come down to the interpretation of the phrase, the same. So it was, you know, in the text, there was a lot of arguments of whether or not the lending could, could we stand up facilities that were similar to the ones stood up in by the CARES Act or, or prior to by the Federal Reserve and kind of backstop by that 450 or so billion dollars? Or do we need legislation for the Fed to lend to these types of programs? Honestly, there, I think it's going to be a lot of lawyers duking out what needs to be done administratively and what needs to be done uh, through, you know, uh, legislation there, I think it's, it's really just going to be a fight among a bunch of lawyers. 
Um, I will say that 13.3 does provide for even more, you know, the Federal Reserve Act section for this um, does provide even more I, I would argue, and my colleagues at Employer America would argue that, you know, they had a lot more wiggle room than they had taken advantage of. And Chair Powell could have been more aggressive on these facilities, even in absence of legislation. Um, I think, you know, there may be caution to do that, given how politicized this was. And I think, you know, Fed independence is so important that people are, are really hesitant to kind of step on the toes of that or to kind of sound any alarms on that. And I would hope that, you know, there we would push the bounds as far as we can so that the Fed can step in to save the economy. There, I think, though, you know, senators didn't like when the Fed started doing things uh, when they weren't doing anything. And so I, I think it, you know, people ignore the Fed a lot of times and that is maybe the wrong decision. I think Chair Powell did a lot of good to say this is how far we can push things when Congress isn't acting. And I would I, I would assume and hope that he will continue to do that in coordination um, with Secretary Yellen when she comes into office. Elizabeth Pancotti, Policy Advisor, Employee America. Thanks so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. All right, folks. Um, uh, there you have it. Uh, the good, bad, and ugly of this, um, this relief package. And so much is riding, Emma, on, on Georgia. Uh, yeah. if, if Ossoff and Warnock, and it is very, very difficult, you know, I've read it. It always feels like you can read positive sort of tea leaves about early voting and whatnot. Uh, but it, it, it feels like 50, 50 to me in terms of whether these are an indication, but if, uh, if the Democrats control the Senate, it's going to mean a, a lifeline. I mean, you know, uh, and it won't be sufficient, I think, uh, for, for what you and I would want. Um, but it's going to mean a lifeline, just barely, yeah. but a lifeline nevertheless for millions of people uh, because this bill is clearly insufficient. And I, it's hard for me to imagine that Mitch McConnell and the Republicans are going to want to do anything for the American public if uh, they can if they can stop it. Right. Well, Biden has said that he wants to do another relief bill, however I would imagine smaller than this, uh, particularly likely when uh, unemployment benefits expire in mid-March. That's not going to happen if Democrats don't take back these two Senate seats. Just not going to. McConnell won't allow it. So uh, the stakes couldn't be higher, as you mentioned. And uh, that's something, obviously, we're going to be watching uh, when we come back uh, from vacation uh, and uh, throughout that time. Uh, folks, uh, thanks for joining us. We'll be back uh, tomorrow for our final live program wow. of 2020. I cannot tell you how happy I am to put this year uh, in our rearview mirror, but we'll have more to say about that uh, tomorrow. Uh, and don't forget, we're uh, you can catch us at 5 p.m. and 10 p.m. on the Peacock app, uh, the Choice Channel. You can also just uh, search Cedar or Majority Report in that app, and you can find us anytime. We'll see you tomorrow. And for those of you who are sticking around, we will uh, head into the uh, fun half of the program. Know me, Const, I think, will, should be joining us any moment. Um, wow, it's Tuesday. It's Tuesday already. I completely am I'm just lost track of I of Yes, I am indefinitely in that sort of like pre-vacation mode where it's, um, you know, oh. running out the door. Uh, know me, you there? We see your picture. Folks, uh, just a reminder, your support makes this show possible. You can become a member by going to jointhemajorityreport.com. Also, don't forget the AM Quickie. Uh, we're going to be doing it for part of uh, break anyways. Uh, check it out, amquickie.com. Get six, seven minutes of headline news every morning via podcast. Uh, and uh, don't forget shop.majorityreportradio.com for merch. Uh, know me. Who's on your show today? Great question. I'm pulling up my booking sheet right now. Oh, man, I should know these things. I feel like the last few days have been insane. Um, what I will do while I'm doing that, because I should know this off the top of my head, uh, is I will announce something that's very exciting. Can I do that instead? Sure. Yeah. This is... <laughs> I feel very honored. I didn't even ask for that. Okay, so um, a few of our viewers and listeners were messaging me like, what books are you reading? What books are you reading? And, and I'm sure they do that with you guys as well. And I decided, um, I, I a few years ago, I did this challenge where I read one book a week for an entire year. And it was 
very difficult. Um, so I thought, why don't we start a book club? And so the Nomiki show now has a book club and thank you to everybody who's already signed up. I'm actually really surprised. I didn't think it was going to be so quick, but everybody, um, you can go to the Nomiki show, uh, Patreon, patreon.com slash the Nomiki show. There's three levels, one book a month, two books a month or four books a month, because I'm going to, I need a community to hold me accountable. And they're not all like 700 page books, like the Tammany uh, or the Plunkett of Tammany hall is this small. So you know, if you're part of the, what we try to balance it out and we do, um, we'll have discussions every week on each of the books, depending on what level you're in and with the authors, with people reading it along with us. Uh, but the first book is actually a gift for early people who sign up right away. Uh, Professor Harvey Kay decided that he was going to donate a bunch of his books on Thomas Paine. So that's our first book, Thomas Paine and the Promise of America. It's a classic. And, uh, that's what we're starting with. Oh, hell yeah. Great idea. You know, um, Matt, maybe you should get in on that. Matt, yes. Matt came and applied for the, the show. I don't know if you heard this story, Emma. Matt came in for his interview. Uh, I don't know how it came up. I don't know if you actually just started, you led with that, Matt, but. It's the top of my resume, probably. Matt had read, I think it was 153 books in the year before he came in. What? It what? was the uh, unemployed year uh, after I graduated from NYU. So <laughs> I had time. That's Read or listened to? Let's uh, clarify. Uh, right. Yeah, that was my uh, deep reading. Well, tell, tell them your, 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 your technology for reading books, consuming books. So yeah, in college, basically my thesis was on uh, using both audio and text at the same time to sort of add that redundancy for uh, recall purposes. So I basically would sp speed read audio books at like, you know, three times the narration speed and then have the text in front of me. Uh, and uh, th the key is to like start, you start uh, slower. And then once you get familiar with like the nouns and, you know, the general ideas of the text, you can like last two, a third of the book you can fly through. But anyway, no addict but for books i mean yeah there's a little bit to that <laughs> perfect yeah. wait we're gonna have to have you on because i don't think i can do a book a week um depending on some of the sizes and and the weeks so i would love to get your tips maybe we can have you on like the first show to yeah, just I mean, advise us <laughs> it's a lot harder when you have a job i found um, <laughs> to do that yeah why don't you layer in kids on that and then see how you do buddy <laughs> You can even watch a movie at three times speed. Or or Twitter, guys. Come on, let's just be real. Like, that's where we spend most of our time. Unfortunately, uh, I spend Also, folks, check out uh, the Antifada. They've got a new Twitch stream, twitch.tv slash the Antifada. Matt, what's happening in the Matlek uh, world uh, media empire? Uh, yeah, for Left Reckoning patrons and then for everybody on Wednesday, uh, David Griscom has an interview with Ashok Kumar or uh, Brosif underscore Stalin on Twitter about India's historic farmer protests and general strike and uh, what's next. So if you've been curious about that, uh, if you're a patron, you can get it right now on audio and video and uh, the, we're going to put it on the show on Wednesday night. We're going to move up the show because of the holiday. So there'll be a live stream Wednesday night for Left Reckoning. All right. Uh, quick break. Six four six two five seven thirty nine twenty is the number. We will be back in a second. Left is best. Jamie and I may have a disagreement. Yeah, you can't just say whatever you want about people just because you're rich. I have an absolute right to mock them on YouTube. He's up there buggy whipping like he's the boss. I am not your employer. You know, I'm tired of the negativity. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. You're nervous, you're a little bit uh, upset, you're riled up. Yeah, maybe you should rethink your defense of that, you fucking idiots. We're just going to get rid of you. All right. But dude. 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 Uh, you want to smoke this joint? Yes. Do you feel like you are a dinosaur? <laughs> That's some good shit. Exactly. I'm happy now. It's a win-win. It's a win-win-win. Oh, uh, hell yeah. Now listen to me. Two, three, four, five times. Eight, four, seven, nine, oh, six, five, oh, one, four, five, seven, two, thirty-eight. 56, 27, one half, 
3.9 billion. Wow. He's the ultimate math nerd. Don't you see? Why don't you get a real job instead of spewing vitriol and hatred, you left-wing Limbaugh? Everybody's taking their dumb juice today. Come on, Sammy. Dance, dance, dance. Rand Paul. I had my first post-coital scene with uh, a woman. I'm hoping to add more moves to my repertoire. All I have is the dip and the swirl. Fine, we can double dip. Yes, this is a perfect moment. No. Wait, what? You make under a million dollars a year. You're scum. You're nothing. Excuse me? Fuck you, you fucking liberal elite. I think you belong in jail. Thank you for saying that, Sam. You're a horrible, despicable person. All right, going to take a quick break. I want to take a moment to talk to some of the libertarians out there. Take whatever vehicle you want. To drive to the library, <laughs> what you're talking about is jibber jab. Classic. I'm feeling more chill already. Good. Donald Trump can kiss all of our asses. Hey, Sam. Hey, Andy. Are you guys ready to uh, do some evil? Hitler was such an idiot. I think I might be a Nazi. Agree. No. Death to America. Do. <laughs> yes. Wow. Wow, that's weird. No way! Unbelievable. This guy's got a really good hook. Throw our hands up. Wow. Sam, I gotta get off. No worries. Let's, let's, I want to just flesh this out a little bit. I mean, look, it's a free speech issue. If you don't like me... Hey, 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 shut up! Thank you for calling into the Majority Report. Sam will be with you shortly. We are back. Uh, let's take some IMs. Uh, Bushwick teacher. I do the same thing uh, when I read, Matt. I've been doing it since middle school. Ooh, well, excuse me. Uh, I, you know, my the first thing I actually did it with, I'm ashamed to say, was uh, Stephen Fry's narration of Harry Potter books when I was a kid. <laughs> Um, not shameful that's great, yeah, well it's true yeah narrations are oh my gosh but books like that though it's enchanting it's not i don't know you know it's not cool like harry potter anymore but like it'll always have nostalgia it gave me the confidence to finish long books as a kid to be honest yeah oh why by reading it yourself yeah like when i could finish like the fourth book and i i read it over like a weekend uh I was very proud of myself and then like I felt that I could read long books after that. I I've been reading Saul. Am I making a mistake? No. We're no, on book just... four right now. No, but I mean the uh the banker goblins, you might want to like gloss over some of the anti Semitic features they have, for instance. Oh no, we promote that in our <laughs> <laughs> Listen, kid, this is how the real world works. You're gonna learn it through Harry Potter. Also the one Asian character is named Cho Chang. Some yeah. Oh man, I forgot all this stuff. Some bad elements, but overall, look, you know, I think it's uh, it's been colored by J.K. Rowling's more problematic persona of the past. Yeah, I but years. I've left that yeah. up when I talked to Saul about the book. Essentially, we don't I don't get into the author that much. But uh, teacher Dan, I don't see a lot of reporting or coverage on mainstream media news outlets describing how inadequate this COVID relief plan is. I see even less talk about the unwillingness of democratic leadership to directly address the material needs and pain and suffering of the neediest amongst us. It's almost that they want to take cover in simply not being Trump. I mean, I will say this. Um, in the morning, I listened to um, a, uh, a radio station that, that plays music and they have an AP briefing. And, and part of the reason why I do it is I'm curious, like what is, uh, what is, what is the AP briefing? And it is always about, Congress's fight. There's never a reporting that like, look, and I, 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 you know, I have that there are obviously I have real problems with Nancy Pelosi. I mean, I think you, you don't have to have listened to this show very long to know that. Um, but the primary story here, the first story, and it goes without saying, we are all savvy about it. People listen to the show are savvy about it. Mitch McConnell and the Republican Party is fundamentally against the idea of helping people out in this situation to the extent that they need to do it. 
They do it because they've got to make sure that they win in Georgia or whatnot. But broadly speaking, you know, like Mitch McCall's bragging about pulling out the idea that you would be get paid leave if you have COVID. I mean, like, honestly, like, how do you even like, how do you wrap your mind around that if you're not a sociopath? And yet you have the AP saying Congress has finally stopped fighting. I don't like everything that was in the Heroes Act at all. We have, you know, uh, the the stuff like the the subsidizing Cobra is insane. But the fact of the matter is, is that the Democrats had passed a three a trillion dollar bill, and now I think they do bad at messaging. Uh, the, you know that didn't really work, <laughs> but we, but they passed it. Yeah, and we touched on we touched on this yesterday when talking about the COVID relief bill, and it's part of my frustration with the media's obsession with deals without wanting to get into the the text of the deal about what Sai was offering, which and making any empirical and uh, analyzing things in any empirical way about what is better and what isn't so they'll be like oh great people need relief no more fighting and right. that's right. where their right. analysis ends and, and nothing about like the 500 million dollars that went to israel just totally no right. big deal oh yeah yeah well that's not going to be i mean that's not going <laughs> like, to be yeah exactly like, what are we kidding? right and then there was a whole there's a there's a whole host of of of, of yeah. crap like that in there but there was also like stuff like there was a bunch of stuff actually they snuck in some like uh, decent climate change uh, yeah. uh, legislation as well. I mean, there is there is that. But even like broad strokes, I'm talking like the AP could could frame it instead of like Congress has finally stopped fighting and they've made a deal. The, the real the real dynamic is uh, McConnell finally gave in because right. of Georgia. I mean, same amount of words. And you, you get you get a better sense of what the dynamic is. I mean, that's just it, what it is. But. Uh, hello from Twitch chat. Hello from your Twitch chat. Love the content. Thank you for not uh, talking about a certain centrist whose name rhymes with boar. Uh, yeah, <laughs> certain centrist. <laughs> went down a rabbit hole yesterday and wow, there were some well-known names and ex-campaign managers who have degenerate uh, disease of debate lords. Can't get solidarity with people constantly being irrational. A disco stew calling him from 605. Um, a square. First, my condolences to John from San Antonio. Wow, that clip of Vivek yesterday was infuriating. Even if this administration does not care, setting expectations of what the federal government can do uh, to get us out of a pandemic is a two for saving lives and politically establishing what is possible. Uh, Pull for us, what, Matt, 135. That's more than I can handle. But for years, uh, from his teens until he was in his 80s, my dad regularly read 1,000 to 1,200 books a year. What? That is. Uh, see, I was doing like one every two days, basically two or three days. I don't know how you do a thousand a year. I, I mean, that level of speed reading, I must say, I think is. I, I need to see proof skill. of it. You have to, You might have that like photographic memory yeah. thing, uh, which is like I think exceedingly rare. But I don't think that could be taught or learned. Yeah, Kim Peek could read both pages at the same time. So you know. Oh. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't do that. <laughs> Uh, Nug Wrangler, YouTube contracts Dominion to count subscriptions. So, uh, so many people have subscribed to the majority report that it broke the algorithm and sent your subs to David Pakman. This explains why he is not the 1 million sub winner. <laughs> and he was born in South America. So, you know, so it doesn't matter. Yeah. It's like John McCain running for president. Well, no, I'm saying there's humility. a connection there to be made. Oh, okay. Got, 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 yeah. Oh, right. I forgot our, our initial scheme here. It was all about Venezuela interfering. Sam Cedar bra salesman. I had to delete Twitter during the whole Jimmy Dore forced the vote nonsense. I realized that it's solely an anger, a circle jerk and not productive. Now my soul stream of politics. I think I'll be better off for it. Um, well, I don't know about that. Um, Sam Cedar bra salesman. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Definitely uh, my favorite advertiser. <laughs> let's, uh, let's play. Oh, let's do this. Uh, this is, we mentioned yesterday, and we played some clips of Dominion, uh, and, and I think it was Smart Tech had basically decided, "Hey, you know what? We're done with all of these baseless lies about our voting technology on 
Fox Business and on World Net. Was it is it World Net Daily that show? Is it what? What is yeah, it? Yeah, I think so. It's a World Net, and um, and so we're going to send them cease and desist letters, and we're going to sue them. And so what happened is you had multiple uh, Fox News hosts and uh, World Net Newsmax. No, oh, Newsmax. Sorry, oh. Newsmax. Interesting. Correction. Newsmax. Right. Newsmax is classier, guys. Come on. Newsmax. <laughs> they had to put uh, extended reports. Basically, um, retracting, they didn't say the word retraction, but they retracting all of their reporting on this. And apparently, uh, there's still some extant uh, people who need to do this. This is, uh, what clip was this with the, uh, with, oh yeah, this is on Newsmax. Um, Seb Gorka is on. Does he have a show on Newsmax? He's filling in for Greg Kelly, who's their night guy. Really normal. A guy from like Fox News news side to, to the head of the Nazi party. What? The, you have uh, Sub Gorka on. He's bringing on Mike Lindell, who we all know is the CEO of My Pillow, and uh, watch him have to shut down Mike Lindell because Sub Gorka has been told <laughs> you cannot let Lindell say this. I believe in this president, but, and I'll tell you what, it, it, nobody realizes, I mean, what a miracle we had on election night at 1115. You know, you talked about all this fraud, doctor, the, the, the biggest fraud is the Dominion machines. And at 1115 on election night, our great president, That's because not, of everything Mike, Mike, I, don't, I don't want to discuss, Mike, Mike, we're not, we're not going to get into the minutiae of the details. I want to ask you, okay. because this show is about courage. It's, it's right. hosted by a guy who's a former Marine. I want to know why you, Mike Lindell, are supporting the president in these legal cases. Well, because everything's on the line here. Everything. There you go. It's about courage, which is why I am terrified to mention the conspiracy theories I've been peddling for months about the <laughs> they're going to sue us, but I'm the courageous one. Right. Let's stick to the courage thing because that's a, a, something we can't measure. Our show As opposed courage. to the reality of what's going on with these conspiracy theories that we have been propagating for literally for weeks. But like, yeah. listen to that, right? Like how they kind of justify their own existence to themselves. Our show is about courage. Could you imagine saying something like that about... Like, I mean, this I is a great that show. Every- I can imagine some people on the left saying something like that. Some people, right. <laughs> That's what Sam said to me during my job interview. He said, listen, first thing I need to know. That's, That's the, the first- more courageous you are, you get little stars. You can wear them on your lapel. That's, that's the first thing I ask um, uh, everyone who comes in for a job interview uh, as a producer. That's the first thing I say. Not I look them in the eye. No, I didn't say this to you. Mm-hmm. I only say it to the, to the males because... <laughs> <laughs> How brave are you? Yeah, and for me, you, are you ready? We're going on YouTube, right? <laughs> I, wait, I after the QAnon thing earlier, Definitely. to make sure that there's no like blinking or sweating. <laughs> you know, like if, you, if I see a drip of sweat going down, you're not hired. It's fired. <laughs> he, Brandon, did he put you guys through obstacle courses where you had to like? <laughs> down a bear you no know, that's right after we arm shirt. wrestle we arm, <laughs> we arm wrestle. you have to do it shirtless though that's the key in the winter exactly <laughs> as cold as brittle as possible yeah yeah it took sam like 10 minutes to find the soundtrack from over the top the old uh, sylvester stallone movie but then we finally arm wrestled right i like <laughs> more obscure stallone yeah <laughs> wow. i don't know gorka last year was uh being anti-qanon and now he's Poo poo in this. It's, I don't know why Gatekeeper Gorka is such a thing now. <laughs> Dr. Gatekeeper Gorka for you. This is interesting, though. When you talk about real bravery, here is a One America Network. Apparently, they didn't get the cease and desist order uh, from uh, Smart Tech and Dominion because they went on Clay Clark, who is Entrepreneur of the Year. I, who gave him that? That uh, himself. <laughs> he paid for an award. He called it that. This is the way that they are going to displace Newsmax, right? I mean, uh, first it was Fox was uh, in the, the pocket of the deep state. Then Newsmax stops talking about it. So they're in the pocket of the deep state. And then it's, so it's one American network still outside of the pocket of the deep state. Mm. 
America's John Hines has been following the possible paths that President Trump may have towards a second term. Now, he recently spoke with Clay Clark, winner of the Entrepreneur of the Year Award, who's been in contact with Lynn Wood to get more on the president's future. Take a look. You were speaking out, and you were speaking out about something that I think that a lot of Americans right now is on their minds, and it has to do with uh, some of these electors which uh, have voted, have voted for uh, Mr. Biden to be president-elect. What seems to be going on, sir? Well, how I would look at uh, the 2020 uh, voting, voting experience for the average American is this. We all went in and voted on uh, hard, using hardware. The, the hardware that we voted on was called uh, Dominion, the Canadian-owned hardware company that tabulates your votes. It has Chinese parts on it. Step two, the software, uh, known as Smartmatic or Sequoia. That, that software was originally coded out by communist Venezuelans. Step three, for added integrity, your votes were shipped to Frankfurt, Germany, where the, your votes were stored on Amazon servers. And then step four, in Amazon. Barcelona, Spain, the votes were somehow tabulated there. And there was a little feature on the software that allows people to switch votes. And so on our podcast, we've interviewed the founder of Overstock.com. We've had the head of, EB, uh, of uh, eBay's uh, fraud protection on our show. And we've had countless experts. And everybody has shown there's irrefutable proof of voter fraud. And so the question I would ask you and I would ask the listeners out there is what kind of people would want to allow outside countries and, and communists and people that don't love America to switch your votes, effectively killing your voice and your ability to vote. What kind of people would be in favor of that? And um, I like when he says parts are made in China. You know, a lot of products are made in China. Just Donald check. Trump's ties. Well, let's just start with this. Smart tech was used in one location in the country for voting, and that was in a county in California. Right. Okay. And then everything else that person said from that moment on was a lie. Uh, the server in Germany and the counting in Spain, that's the thing. Should not have, they should not have put little notations in Spanish in the, uh, <laughs> with the theta. Too. That's what gave it away. It was Castilian, yeah. yeah. No, it's if it were in New York, North Korea, though, it'd be completely fine. Like this is. But the, what's amazing to me is that there's like a whole industry now of like that is you know it's not you know it, at one point it was just Alex Jones and people were just like Alex yeah. Jones at least at that time would signify like he's crazy and he's you know it's it's sort of fun to watch and he's got these wild ideas, but this is just slowly creeping in. And it's only receding because of that lawsuit. I mean, this is it's this is a guy who's going on there, has every trappings of someone who is, you know, legit-ish, and just telling bald face lies, total lies. And uh I think, Sam, but this is kind of like I think that's why the, the the person who shall not be named, why it's so powerful what happened in terms of the lies that were spread is that there is a real conscious effort, as we know on this show, as anybody on YouTube on the left knows, to to normalize this. It used to be Alex Jones, who's absolutely effing crazy, and Milo, who, who's crazy. But now Own is trying to pretend that they're a news network for the boomers who watch it, who unplug from Fox News because they don't trust it or whatever. And so it's becoming more and more normalized so that even on the left, it's okay now to just go on YouTube and straight up lie and go on Twitter and straight up lie as long as it's formatted in a way that's acceptable for the audience. And it's just gonna creep, it's just gonna get worse and worse and become more normalized in a way that like any sort of criticism we have of MSNBC goes out the door because this is going to be our new norm on both sides. And I think that's something that like the tech companies have to crack down. I don't know how, I mean, I'm not saying like they deplatform or edit or anything like that. I'm just saying stop rewarding this shit. I, I there is, I, I think that, you know, th this is, there will have to be some type of reform. I mean, I think it basically comes down to this, you know, there's a difference between like sort of deplatforming and demonetizing, right? Yeah. And this is what the, this is the conversation you never really hear. It's like, okay, instead of deplatforming these people, pull the ads, pull the ads and say, you can't, you know, and no links, 
Um, or, or adjust the algorithm. I mean, let's just be really honest. We're going to talk about it in our show today. And I tweeted about it and people said, oh, identity politics. Our, my audience is 87% male under the age of 44. And that I think is probably very similar to most of political YouTube. And it is way worse on the right wing's side. And that is because it feeds it. Like you, we all know this, that the algorithm feeds on itself. And so you're, you're not just propping up these people that are tapping into anger and, and insecurity and rage, but you're also pushing out voices like, so we all have to sit here, the, the reasonable ones, to kind of like break the algorithm. It's not just about the ads, which of course, they shouldn't receive ads if they're flat out lying and they're conspiracy theorists and they're denying that like mass shootings happened. What's happening on the left, by the way, there are people who are monetized that way. It's that they're pushed to the top. Well, well, I, I, you know, I I mean, I've talked in the past where I think if you, through antitrust, you can regulate uh, how much data is collected uh, by viewers and that can cut into the efficacy of, of an algorithm. Um, And also, but I do think that, you know, you start with demonetization and, um, you know, I mean, I I just remember I I came from a school of comedy where people were like, you know, to do, um, you know, we're not going to, you know, we were very much, many of us were very much against like the idea of, of, of the industry that was existing. And I was like, well, I mean, if you're really against it, just go do regional theater. You can like you have the opportunity right. to you know this is you want to be on commercial television. It's going to be they're going to sell soap in between. I mean you're just there to sell the soap. And the 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 bottom line is I think that like if people were demonetized on these platforms, um, there would be a lot less incentive to produce this type of content. And, well, and that's think, just the reality of it. Yeah. Um, and that that's where I would start because then you're not inhibiting anybody's free speech and you're not, you're just basically saying like, okay, you just, we're not going to put, but there's a hesitancy for Google and Facebook to do that because they're making a ton of money off it too. Well, I think that's why the antitrust is so important. Um, like the, what what the New York Attorney General uh, is doing right now, and and what some of the conversations have been about breaking up these big tech companies. But just going back to Nomi's point about the audience being disproportionately male, I mean, I want more women to engage in this online political culture. In my view, right? I think um, yeah. there are consequences for it being sort of an all male echo chamber. Um, and the person who we're talking about before, I, I think, uh, you know, feeds into some sexist attitudes that are latent and not really picked up on by a lot of men. And it's not their fault, right? It's just some things that maybe you and I might notice, know me about tones and the way uh, certain politicians are attacked with vitriol and others aren't. Um, and I think it also just feeds on itself too, where if you have this algorithm that's constantly recommending different creators and different progressive YouTubers or different right-wing YouTubers where it's an echo chamber on both sides, then it doesn't let women into the same, into the That's right. And that's where the capitalism overlaps. I tweeted about this and I got like, people like, you're using the Bernie bro thing. I'm like, I'm not using the Bernie bro thing. I am a woman on YouTube and I'm a woman on YouTube who has a following like you do, Emma. And it is just, we just don't use the same rhetoric and, and and we're not propped by some capitalist, you know, company like MSNBC or whatever. So your videos aren't forced into your feed. I don't know about you, Emma, but when I open up my feed on YouTube, I tested this out yesterday. Um, none of the suggested videos until like the 20th down is usually the majority report. None of them are anything I watch. I had Grace Kelly reenactments, of course, makeup tutorials. So it's, it's beyond just like what's normally going to show up on our feed. I actually think there's something in the algorithm that is skewing towards i mean i don't watch any of these things why am i seeing this as a woman and yeah. I, I mean i'd be curious to see what other women think and that's why i mean see i'm, I'm gonna give you a compliment real quick sorry to say to to, to go on he'll take you have, yeah, he'll take it you know what you've been able to do in shifting jimmy doors of the i used the word <laughs> sorry it's like using q you can't see the word <laughs> In, in shifting um, libertarians over to the left or certain, you know, bringing in audience members into more reasonable, you've also introduced that audience to us 
And, and, you know, I know my audience is very much reflective of the majority report audience. And on Friday, we have an entire conversation about every Friday, sex and, and, and class, women in class. And now I know that that audience is learning about things that may not be in their feed, but we have to be really conscious of this stuff and, and have like a strategy when normally it would just the hard part about having a strategy, I mean, I do know that, you know, uh, YouTube was public about um, favoring institutional news sources over independent ones. And they, they made that decision. I, I, I can't remember if it was this year or last year. I can't even remember. It, the problem is, is that the, the algorithm is, is, is not transparent, I mean, at all. And so it's very difficult to figure out how to do that, um, how to, you know, sort of break through that. But yeah, this is a big problem that I think there are, it's going to have to be attacked sideways because, you know, uh, there's, it is, um, there's a certain amount of like subjectivity as to who, you know, who should be uh, platformed, who should not be platformed, this and that. And, you know, that's, I mean, that's a big reason why I'm not comfortable with being nationalized because um, I certainly don't want the government involved in that. And um, I don't want corporations terribly involved in it either but I think the only way to deal with it is you can you, corporations can make that determination, but they cannot function as public utilities. And that has to do with their size. And and I don't know that there is an inherent value, particularly in in this in 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 the in the context of a society as it exists now in having the one place where everybody goes to. Right. I mean, so I would prefer five or six YouTubes, as it were, that are not as lucrative, that, that cannot be. And that's, you know, in the context of a capitalist society, um, by regulating out the ability to make profit in certain areas, uh, confiscatory regulation, if you want to call it whatever, antitrust, you, you will change behaviors in that way you and we do that we do that already right like you can't um like it's there are certain things that you cannot uh incentivize by getting paid to do or or you know there are certain things that are illegal like in and we have environmental regulations we have these are all regulations that are not necessarily there to inhibit um profitability but they're there to protect us and uh and and make these other activities ultimately less profitable. And so they, you know, th that's, that's basically what it comes down to. And, um, but we should, we have some breaking news. Um, Gavin Newsom is appointing Alex Padilla, California secretary of state, um, to replace Catherine Harris. Oh, great. First so, seen as the front runner. Yeah. Um, I don't know much about Padilla. To be honest, it was the whole like DN of the, the vote count thing in 2016. He was, or it was 2016. Yeah. 2016. I can't even keep track anymore. Remember I, this? No, he, he, he was the certifying the election results. Uh, whatever. It's, it's 2016 drama that we don't need to go over again. Um, yeah, let's, but, but I think the, the broader point of what we were talking about is that like, and this is going to be just an increasing problem. It's just going to be like, you're, you're going to be dealing with misinformation. You're going to be dealing with, with, uh, you know, and, and there's always, I, I don't know what's worse, you know, uh, a, a completely uninformed um, uh, public uh, or, or a public that's informed exclusively by, um, by voices that are, um, have a vested interest in certain things not being covered or by a public that is, um, you know, fractured in getting its information from different places and, and some of it being less than rigorous. I mean, I, you know, well, I there's mean, problems I, with both. Yeah, but I, 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 I hate the talking point of like, oh, we're more polarized than ever, right? Yeah. Um, but there is something about the algorithm of these social media companies that say you stumble upon and get really into, I don't know, whatever, a Jordan Peterson video or a Ben Shapiro video. And that's what you're going to see. You're going to get that recommended and it's going to be this circular thing over and over again. And on the left, I mean, there's it's less dangerous in my view, but say you do follow someone like who we aren't mentioning, um, then that. Why can, are we not mentioning? I don't know. We just decided. <laughs> it's like no one got a memo. <laughs> Let me see here. Yeah, it's Jimmy Dore that edits the name of Sam out of his show. Oh. Then that's a fact that actually happened. 
Yes. I listen. <laughs> that was a very funny video. Have you ever seen that one? No, no. Uh, he was interviewing that guy. Um, oh, and this is actually remind. <laughs> Well, do your point. My I'll, final I'll point is just that, yeah, I, there is some truth to that very trite talking point that polarization and, and radicalism is increased by the social media. Radicalism is better for the left right now, but we're seeing right now, I think, a turn where it's becoming a bit unhinged and we can going further down that path if there isn't some regulation where the algorithm is changed in order to in, integrate different types of uh, content that's being seen by. Can I just make one little point at the end before you, you, real quick, what you just said about radicalization, this is dangerous. Like one thing that we're not talking about is how dangerous this is. Reflecting back on history when, whether it's far right or, or what people thought was the media claimed was far left, this is dangerous. I mean, I was, my parents received a, I don't want to get into it because people are questioning me, but I had a report of threat where my parents named, they were doxxed essentially. My parents, because I was criticizing it. This is just me on Twitter. Imagine what AOC is going through. Imagine what the squad's going through. They have security with them at all times. Cori Bush isn't even inaugurated. She doesn't even have some of the benefits that you get when you go into Congress. So she is secure. This is insane. This is insane. And, and they're preying not just on insecurity, but there is an anger that is not being, you know, all it takes is a couple of people. That's it. And so, you know, for anything, if YouTube wants to crack down on radicalization of the right, because that's really what this is, then they should be much more thoughtful about, you know, who gets monetized. Beyond Jimmy, there are some other people that are being platformed right now that are, are gr great conspiracy theorists. You know, I, I mean, that, that was the, it was actually, it was the interview of that guy, Caleb Kane, I think his name was. He was that yep. guy who the New York Times had written that piece about having YouTube radicalizing people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Jimmy had this guy, Caleb Kane, on ostensibly because he didn't believe the article. And it sort of didn't work out. Or Caleb King. It didn't, it didn't, okay. uh, it didn't work out for him, uh, you know, to try and prove that, that YouTube doesn't do this. And he saw this as an attack on independent media. Uh, and apparently Caleb had mentioned like, well, I had watched, you know, you guys and Sam Cedar, and that's how I sort of came out of the thing. And he, <laughs> oh my God. he because I, I don't know, I don't know why he did that, but, but, but I know there has been a subsequent, there's been a subsequent uh, report on um, the shooter. And I can't remember now what it, it just came out actually like three or four weeks ago. Uh, documenting the implica the, the how uh, how YouTube like yes. stepped on you. I cannot remember who who the, the 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 shooter was, but was had been radicalized by 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 YouTube. And I think it's a, I, I mean I think like radicalization, uh, right wing radicalization, I think is is problematic on YouTube. But I think just broadly speaking, there is look the way that this you know one of the the ironies is is that. You would hear um, uh, people criticized because they're chasing after ratings on cable television. There is no more sensitive feedback loop in terms of viewers and in terms of dollars than YouTube. This happens, I will know in an hour or I will know in 10 hours, you know, how many views we have on this video. I will know in 10 hours how many dollars I'm going to make on this. Um, I don't care who you are. That information is going to impact you. Some people more, some people less. Right. Not our primary, um, you know, on this program, it's not our primary. I don't, I don't, I, I try not to have a primary other than membership, a primary um, uh, revenue source. Um, but it is, uh, it, it, it impacts people. And so, well, uh, but, and then just to put a button on the point that Nomi brought up, uh, I think is he one about the, you know, political lefty news audience. And, and my impression was uh, at TYT, it was very similar, uh, tr trending way more male disproportionately 80% plus. Um, then that feedback back loop is also predicated on not bringing up issues that might be uncomfortable about like sexism that, you know, I, I think a lot of people sometimes can't see. Um, it, it's it's not empirical, so it's not easy to talk about, but it is a lived experience. So, uh, like, 
I used to feel very hesitant talking about those things. And I still did. Like when, even when we were talking about the Jimmy thing, I, I, I've always gotten the sexist vibe from him and I got it in the commentary. I'm not even talking about uh, personally. And um, I didn't want to say that because I'm like, oh, God, but that's not the way because I know, you know, what the response is going to be. And that's it's punishment. It's actual punishment. It's not that it's not incentivized. You actually receive punishment. Yeah. And the video doesn't circulate. And that's the direct result of the the algorithm favoring, um, you know, m- more male of a male audience. But obviously the, the audience that watches the majority report and has been cultivated here very as to give Sam credit, um, very uh, deftly by Sam because he doesn't engage in the toxicity, um, doesn't behave this well, way. Yeah. Think of like where YouTube was 10 years ago. It was all videos of like uh, Christopher Hitchens humiliates dumb Muslim. Like those were like actual titles of yeah. clips people would click on and they'd go super viral. And yeah, yeah well, this is all downstream of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. All right, let's go uh, to the phones here. Uh, pull this up. Wow, wow, we got a lot of people on the uh, phones here. Let's go call them from a 412 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Oh, is this me? Yeah, who's this? Where are you calling from? Oh, wow, cool. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is, sorry, this is the first time I've ever done something like this. Um, awesome. um, um, I'm calling from Miami. Uh, I've been watching you guys for probably like a year now. Um, I, it's funny the topic you were just kind of talking about because I grew up uh, in a predominantly right-wing family, and I've slowly over the past few years shifted more to the left to the point of I'm really intrigued by the whole concept of anarcho-syndicalism and left libertarianism and um michael in fact was a a big influence as of recently sort of to my political evolution um and initially when i first saw him on your show i wasn't really i didn't really i he kind of came off as condescending and it wasn't until i heard him on thad russell's podcast Mm. where i really got to hear more of like where he was coming from and he really got to explain like his point of view and i think there's i think there is some benefit in trying to be a little you know this whole week this whole jimmy thing right if i was if I was still uh, my old self, I would I would be loving this because it just mm-hmm. it, it it makes you guys look petty and like yeah. almost like in high school drama and then right you know I I don't want to dismiss you know what I was just talking about but I think there's a certain level of like look people are people are angry right now and. It doesn't help like people there's there's valid reasons for people to be angry right now and obviously there's a lot of different outlets misinforming people and telling you this is the reason this is the person who's the cause of all your problems and stuff like that i think people just need to just chill out for a second like really like see where we're trying to come from because it's like you know you want to talk about lived experience you know everyone's lived experience is unique and different and intersectional in so many different ways. And when we put each other in these different groups, I don't, I don't think it helps. I just, it just, it's, it's making us lose focus from what's really important right now. And that's yeah, I, we're suffering. I think that's a, I, I mean, I think that's a good point. I should say, first off that uh, part of Michael's job description on this program anyways, was to be condescending. <laughs> And so I did, I did give him a, a condescending bonus. Um, this part of the courage bonus, same thing. Right, right. But no, I think, listen, I think you're, I, you know, I, I, I certainly had no intention of, of, of talking about this uh, uh, today. I mean, I think it's a lar- uh, one of the r- reasons why I think like, um, you know, the, the whole thing has been problematic. And, and you know, I, I just remind people like, 
three or four weeks ago uh, when uh, the idea of, of of forcing this vote was first floated, I, I, I gave, you know, I, I wasn't a, a resounding endorsement, but I certainly endorsed the the idea. I, 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 I largely feel like, you know, uh, a thousand flowers bloom. It became problematic for me where I realized it was not so much a, um, and, 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 you know, at the time I did say like, you know, it might be better to, to try and get something more material than that, but whatever, like I say, a thousand flowers bloom. But when it turns into a, uh, a mechanism uh, to, that undercuts the little progressive power that we have That's right. in Congress, it became an issue. But I, but I, 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 I do appreciate the, the idea that this sounds super petty. And on some level, it, it really is. I mean, we're talking about a very, very yeah, narrow mean, corner of, of even like the political podcast world, right? Like, I mean, uh, the, the, there's, and, and to a certain extent, uh, a lot of these shows are fighting for, you know, attention and and this and that. And it it, I think part of it is also like whenever I turn on any of my, you know, devices to go and get the stories that I'm looking for, uh, I, we're all inundated by comments about this stuff. Yeah, so yeah. It, that's I, right. I get what you're saying. I mean, it does seem very petty. There are personal. You know, I, I so for example, if like Anna has gone after or a friend of mine, I respond, you know, maybe I shouldn't do that. But um, so your personal feelings do get involved for sure. But part of and part of why I, I have replied and maybe why we've talked about this a little more than uh, some people would like is because I do think it's important to call exactly what Sam talking about. about um, because yeah. I think we have a responsibility to hold our uh, peers ostensibly accountable to not engage in the toxicity that, say, we see with Alex Jones on the right. Um, that the whole right-wing media operati- apparatus was already vile, but has descended into conspiracy theory peddling and just and just vileness um, in, a, in a whole different stratosphere. So that's part of maybe why uh, I, I may have come off as aggressive in this area uh, to you, um, but, but that's really where I see it. Well, it's also, if you don't set the record, I mean, even like if you're running for office or whatever, if you want to look at political, like pretend this is a political campaign, you sometimes have to, if, if, if they're determining the messaging, they're determining the messaging. Like the fact that like you had to go out there and set your record straight, or I had to be like, guys, I'm not a CIA agent. Cause like, that's the thing that's being peddled on the internet right now about me. <laughs> like it's, it's then they're determining the messaging and then it's going to be rewarded. And so the pettiness is rewarded, as we know, but like sometimes you have to respond. It doesn't mean that you engage in their critique. It just means you're setting the record straight. Yeah. I mean, I, but I feel like we've, we have certainly, I think like fulfilled that obligation. Right? <laughs> That's why I said the person who goes without name. All right, but go ahead. Say uh, it's, it's, uh, well, last word. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, I think the way to address these things is not, Twitter. Like, if you want to have these dialogues, I think you need to, like, actually sort them out. Now, I know you and Jimmy, I guess, I don't know what your speaking relationship. You, I guess, have said, like, he's welcome to call in. I, he's probably not interested, it seems like. It's gotten to a really toxic point at this point. But, you know, I think, like, you know, no, 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 Miki, I've, uh, I've seen you on, uh, like, Michael Malice's show before. Yeah. I think doing stuff like that, like, being able to get yourself onto some of these platforms or like Bosch being on Tim pool. Like I think those sorts of things do far more to bring people like me over to your side. Yeah. I, I, I would comment on the uh, Michael appearance on Thaddeus Russell's show. I think that's one of his, I, I would, I would say Michael sometimes uh, wasn't the best guest, uh, but that is one of his best appearances on somebody else's show and really puts <laughs> his sort of uh, worldview very clearly so, to Thaddeus. It occurs me like we, you know, um, w- we should probably put a link to that. I was just going to say, yeah. <laughs> interview that, 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 you know, that where Jimmy and I had our first debate about his perspective on uh, the, the, the whole strategy, which started because I, I, I work under the assumption that people know that, but the vast majority of people hear this stuff. Don't, don't understand where this started from. Uh, and it has continued since then. Let's go back to the phones. Call him from uh, a 512 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? 
good afternoon, Sam. Um, it's Lucy Brooklyn. Hi, Lucy. Can you speak in your uh, your phone a little bit closer? Uh, let's give this a try. Is this better? Much better. Um, hi. Um, hope hi. you guys are doing well. Um, before I say anything else, I just want to offer my deepest condolences to the MR team for the loss of Michael. Um, and also to John from San Antonio. Um, I lost my father years ago in a similar fashion, so I entirely empathize. Um, so my heart goes out to him. Um, so two things. Um, first, I wanted to plug um, my mutual aid group. Um, we're called the Supper Collective. Uh, we started at City Hall. Um, at the sit-in protest, we're a group of unemployed restaurant workers that just decided to cook food for people, you know, 24, hour, uh, 24 hours a day for the, you know, four to six weeks that we were at City Hall. Um, we decided to make that into a nonprofit, and so now we cook uh, between 500 to 750 meals a week to communities in Flatbush, um, Bushwick, and Queens. What's it called? Um, Supper what? It's called Supper Collective. Supper. That's awesome. And Supper Collective. Is it? Can we put a, re- a link somewhere to that? Um, you can. So we are on Instagram. Look up Supper Collective NYC. Um, we have a fen- Venmo, Supper Collective NYC, a GoFundMe, Supper Collective NYC. Um, and also for those who are worried about their taxes, um, we also partnered with Open Collective. Um, so donations can be tax deductible um, through that mm-hmm. site as well. And this is um, you guys, SupperCollective.org? SupperCollective.org, yes. Yeah. Awesome. Um, and um, it's, you know, Black-led. I'm, you know, a Haitian woman. And <laughs> the last time I, the first time I called in, someone said again that I uh, sounded like uh, I wasn't Black, but uh, no, still Black. Um, but Whoa. Yeah. Okay. So, so, yeah, full Black. Full Black. Stay, stay um, Black. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, I mean, like, we're... We're working between 30 to 60 hours a week, no pay. Wow. Um, sometimes some of us are getting unemployment, um, but obviously it's not enough. But, you know, we have nothing to do, nothing better to do. We're also passionate and we're also trying to, you know, provide some sort of network of support um, that's also COVID safe. Um, and, you know, to that note, I kind of wanted, um, and so, yeah, any contributions help, um, either monetary or if you want to volunteer in the new year um, or offer any food donations. Um, we're also looking for a larger kitchen space so we can expand um, our reach, um, but anything helps. Um, but from that, I kind of wanted to transition a little bit. Uh, from being on the ground, in City Hall, like, you know, I was there from the first day of the George Floyd protest in, um, by uh, Atlantic Avenue, Um, being there in City Hall, doing mutual aid work now, and talking to people every day in in shelters, you know, or by food bank lines, like, the left is utterly disconnected from the everyday reality, from people on the, the ground that they claim to fight for. Um, like the Caribbean and, and Hispanic women who are waiting hours and hours in line outside of church food banks or looking for something in a community fridge to bring back to their, their homes, they don't give a damn about any of the purity tests that right. you know, the theatrical purity tests that we put on ourselves online or, you know, in the halls of Congress. And, you know, the people who are lucky enough to have work they're not going to jeopardize the one lifeline that they have left for a general strike. It sounds great, but there, there's no evidence that there are going to be any material or substantive right. resources for them if they give up that lifeline. And so, you know, when I see from, you know, my radical leftist friends um, and, you know, we need a general strike, we need everybody to, you know, be out in the streets. It's like, there's still a pandemic going on that is primarily killing black and brown people. Yeah. Why, what, what incentive do they have to risk themselves, put themselves at risk um, of being abducted by law enforcement, um, risking COVID or losing their work, you know, right. to go out, shout in the sc- streets and, you know, have no food, uh, no water, no contributions to their rent payments. 
And, you know, they're apathetic to a lot of the, you know, political apparatus because they haven't seen results. Um, there's another partnering network that we work with, um, Equality for Flatbush. They've been doing tenant protections for, you know, almost a decade now. Um, it's another black run group. And, you know, they, <laughs> they've been working, you know, again, same as us, full time, no pay to help protect these tenants. And the tenants are like, we love what you're doing. We believe in what you're doing, but like, how long can we keep doing this? How long can we keep going through these legal battles and these like weekly panic attacks about whether or not someone's going to bust through our door and rip us out of our homes? Like, how long can we keep doing this? When is there something that's going to be like a lasting change? And so when I take a glimpse at, you know, this foolishness that's happening online, I'm like somewhere between enraged and hysterical right? because it's just, it's so utterly disconnected. And, you know, it's, it's crazy to me that, that these people are also forgetting, like, uh, that there's a pandemic outside. There's a pandemic in people's homes, like, you know, and it's completely, you know, ravaged everyone's financial uh, status. Like my savings are gone. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. Jeff Stein mentioned before any savings that, you know, we could have uh, gleaned from the additional 600 a week um, and the 1200. I mean, it's been nine months yeah. and it's impossible to get people into uh, new apartments right. and the requirement to even move. Who has 40 times? It's insane. Amount of <laughs> <laughs> right now. Yeah. Who has that money? And it's criminal have it in a savings account right like that then we we throw it all into this new apartment we get in there and then how do we feed ourselves right how do we clothe ourselves and you know and this is my last thing uh a lot of the the derision and disdain that i've been seeing for you know people who are protesting is uh, astonishing to me, um, especially when they use the imagery to fundraise and run their campaigns um, <laughs> and their YouTube channels. It's it's astonishing to me because you know, I speaking for myself and a lot of my colleagues in the volunteer work, we don't actually want to be in the streets. We don't want to be setting things on fire. We don't want to. Uh, we don't want to disrupt. You know our our lives our personal lives put our personal lives at risk um just for basic necessities we don't want to be doing that we also don't want to be locked in our homes uh doing nothing and losing a uh, sense of social stability we just want we want things to do we want to go back to uh cooking we want to go back to serving wine or doing design work or creative work or whatever it was that people were doing before we don't want to be out in the streets protesting, but we have nothing else to do because there have been no substantive uh, resources provided right. to us. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's heinous and it's evil. The amount of uh, dismissiveness that I, you know, I'm seeing from politicians and, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying that this is everybody. I know that there are people in local offices who, you know, have been assisting and doing their best, but you know, it, it's just it's crazy to me just to see how like the the disparate narratives between you know what I'm hearing from you know the women in the shelters that we feed and what I'm hearing from you know right. people posting snake emojis on Twitter. Exactly. It's like That's... y'all y'all don't y'all don't know what you're talking about. Y'all are not <laughs> y'all are not representing like I we do want Medicare for all, but we need money. We need food. We need safety. And, you know, right. if anyone's going to put their lives on the line for anything, it has to be something substantive that actually has a chance of reaching everyday people. Um, so, yeah, sorry. Sorry for going. No, but so I long. think, see, I, I mean, this is there's 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 there there's there's so much here that you're you're talking about that is sort of um, indicative of of our system being broken. I mean, I think like, look, the. Um, the, you know, I, I mean, I think what you're expressing on some level is why, you know, Joe Biden 
uh, won in the, the Democratic primary is because of a sort of a practical desire to have some, uh, some, you know, the best chance at some, you know, slight differential in terms of, of providing for people. I mean, the fact of the matter is, and I've been highly critical of Pelosi's sort of politics and all this and some of the, the policy prescriptions, uh, but the fact is, is that in the absence of a Republican Party right now, there would be more help. Sufficient, maybe not, but, a, you know, some is, is you know, a, a, a half a loaf is helpful on some level, um, you know, a, 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 to people who are desperate for things like food um, or, right. you know, or, right. you know, in some rental assistance it's, or eviction moratorium is better than than um, the, the constant threat of being evicted. But of course, there needs to be structural change. And then the question becomes like, how do we get structural change when we have intractable foes and then, um, you know, potential allies like there's a whole spectrum of people who n need to be um you know who need to either be defeated or need to be sort of pressured and you know th the best that that we can do at least in the context of like sitting in a studio doing like a, a youtube show is try and sort of delineate who those people are and also, you know, attempt to delineate the priorities. I think it's helpful, you know, for you to to call in and to, you know, remind people like there are, there are people who have immediate needs, really are not terribly right. concerned about the, you know, what to them, you know, seem relatively academic and in many respects are distinctions at this point. Like there needs to be sort of some type of immediate relief and, you know, and to that point, actually, uh, uh, Nomi Key, you brought up Cori Bush earlier. Yeah. Cori Bush, you know, she has a very similar, uh, like, life timeline to me. Like, I, you know, grew up in, in poverty as well um, and kind of, quote, quote, unquote, worked my way up, you know, to just above poverty. But, you know, the, the hate that she's receiving online, it's like, and from the left, it's crazy to me because it's like, yo, y'all, she literally is doing all of the things that you say that we're supposed to do. She did the direct action. She was on the street protesting. Um, she was doing mutual aid work and community organizing and grassroots building. Now yeah. she's in Congress trying to gain actual power for the left. She hasn't even been sworn in yet. Yeah. And she's, she's suddenly a snake. And it's like, y'all, like, we barely, we barely have any representation, and the few that we have that, mind you, actually don't technically represent a lot of the people who are, you know, based in California, Texas, et cetera. Like, <laughs> they're not, like, they're, they're attacking them. It's like, y'all, like, why, why are we, why are we attacking the, the little strands, the, the little strand of power that we have. Can I, can I just make one point on that? Because I think what you just said illustrates this so well. I mean, Corey, I, I, I'm, I'm very good friends with Corey, right? So I know what she went through over the last few years. Her car was evicted, or evicted, uh, 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 what's it called? Oh, my God. <laughs> Possessed, Please thank possess. you. <laughs> thank you. Possessed the last day of her last campaign when she lost. She has literally put it all on the line for... I mean, because she didn't have a choice, not because because she there, because she was so angry at the system that she decided to put herself forward. Now, that's like real. And that was because she had real material needs and her community had real material needs that were not being addressed. Simultaneously, though, I think I mean, this is why I keep going back to labor. When you look at the, the, the folks who are on the front lines, how many of, of I mean, the majority of these frontline uh, industries that are unionized are women led unions and women made up of unions and the majority are women of color and many immigrants when whether it's domestic workers or nurses i mean we know what the makeup is and so i i think i really truly believe the only way to counter this 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 whether it's strategically done so to divide us or not to counter this messaging about a a um, arguing over a strategy for Medicare for all is to actually have the stakeholders who've been organizing around this and who are deeply affected out there pressuring the lawmakers that we need to bring in. And, you know, and one of my biggest frustrations about this argument is that where is NNU? I mean, why, 
why is that YouTube host leading this charge when the folks who've been organizing, whether it's NNU, literally NNU spent the last decade making sure that Medicare for all was the most popular policy uh, um, policy idea in the country. They brought it to Bernie Sanders, so he made it popular. And so if, if we're going to go to and figure out how these things get addressed, these structural things get addressed and immediate needs get addressed, I really think that we um, as a community, maybe we all start elevating more uh, leaders in these unions and more people who are actually deeply affected rather than YouTube hosts commenting on other YouTube hosts stuff, including ourselves. Well, and, and also and also, if you don't like the way things are being done, do it differently. You know, start start your own mutual aid network. Yeah. Start your own start your own like like organization of outreach grassroots yeah. and, and see how successful it can be. You know, if it's not if you don't feel like it's being done the right way, then do it another way. Do something or bring attention to people who you feel are actually doing something. That's instead right. of to other people who just agree with you yeah, and online. Yeah, power, you know, power building is delicate. Sorry. Is I, I think part of what we're honing in on here, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I think this this uh, dovetails with what you're saying. Like the representatives who are, in terms of their ideology, aligned with all of us, um, like Cori Bush comes from a working class background. She's not a snake, obviously, right? right? Um, they, they are trying to the best of their ability, and I'm not saying they're above reproach and can't be questioned, but it's so easy to demand things from the outside when, you know, the, the, it, it, you have to use your power delicately and with strategy. And I think that's, some of the, the frustration yeah, I mean, here is like going for more realistic things like a $15 minimum wage. That's very possible. Say right. if the Democrats take back the Senate, things like that. And, you know, to that to that point, Emma, you know, uh, in terms of, you know, the delicacy, I mean, of when we transition from doing food for protest to mutual aid and becoming a nonprofit, you know, we had to weigh a lot of those things carefully because we knew a lot of our activist friends would give us some side eye, you know, from going, you know, going legit or, or whatever it is. But in order for us to have any sort of access to the larger resources that are available, like we, we had to go some form of legit in order, you know, to bring those resources that are, by the way, locked up um, wastefully in a lot of red tape. Uh, I, I don't know if you guys heard about the USDA um, boxes, uh, yes. meal boxes that were being, the, the, like yeah. last two weeks, so we were, uh, we organized with a couple other mutual aid groups to do distribution of those boxes. Um, and one weekend there were a thousand boxes that were available. 700 of those thousands just disappeared and no one knows where they went. What? And the there's yes, seven hundred of the thousand. And there's evidence that the USDA boxes are going somewhere because we're seeing the boxes themselves blown in the wind in piles in different neighborhoods. We're seeing the uh the food products from within the boxes. You know, people, you know, wherever they're they're salvaged from, people are taking what they need and then throwing the rest you know, on the side of the street um, in, in piles. And, you know, a lot of the reason why the 700 of the thousand went missing was because there's, there's no, there's no line of, of organization right. between the, the right. USDA we, and the, 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 the families that are right. receiving them. Right. We have no infrastructure for this. I mean, it, and it, it, I mean, it's a problem. I mean, it's a problem in terms of unemployment. It's a, t a problem in terms of like uh, the, the the stimulus checks. It's a problem in terms of uh, you know, particularly in terms of kids who are not going to schools. Um, well, Lu Lucy, I uh, appreciate the call, and you know, um, I think at the very least, you know, what we can do is try and you know, platform more people who are doing this stuff and and advocating, um, and have been advocating, you know. It's 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 an unfortunate mix and reality of our society that like, you know, 
the platforms that we have because we're you know uh, adjacent to Twitter and whatnot, and there's a lot of journalists there. That's what creates the media. I mean, that's just yeah, like right. and and how you know. I mean, that's the thing that's so amazing about someone like 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 Cory Bush is that you're, you're you're having someone actually sort of get into the halls of power and at the very least be a voice there. But, you know, if we want to, um, but, you know, we need to support her like, you know, it's like I was using this example the other day. It's like. I need to hammer in a nail. And if I take this uh, remote for my camera, I'm just going to smash the remote and then I'm not going to be able to even function my camera. And, and it's like, right. we need to know the, uh, the, the, the strength of our allies and what yeah. we reasonably expect from them. And then we also need to know what are the immediate needs and, and respect what the immediate needs are um, it, uh, amongst people who ostensibly we are trying to advocate uh, on their behalf. But uh, Lucy, I appreciate the work. We're going to put a link up to uh, Supper Collective. Supper Collective, yeah. And, um, uh, and, and thank th you so much and happy holidays. Holidays. Uh, well, Thanks happy for your work. Monica, thank you. Um, and uh, happy Kwanzaa to anyone uh, <laughs> anyone celebrating Lucy. that as well. Thank right, you. Bye. -bye. bye. bye. Um, so we got some more news. Uh, Ari Berman reports that New York has become the 20th state to enact automatic voter registration. Yes. Cuomo has signed the bill and it could register 1 million new voters in state. Um, I mean, this is huge. It's, it's huge. It's a big, um, you know, it's, shout out to my Senator, Senator Gennaris, deputy leader. He's been yeah. advocating for that. And, and it's also like, you know, this has been a really in many respects, an eight year process, right? Like, Zephyr Teach out running against uh, Cuomo at the time, and then uh, Nixon running against Cuomo, bringing attention to the IDC, making sure that we have a supermajority where it's difficult for uh, for Cuomo to veto certain things. Yep. Um, and yes, Andrew Cuomo, I can't, it's hard for me to imagine uh, a, a politician that I have. Well, Joe Lieberman comes to mind, but, you know, <laughs> there's certain uh, Northeast Democrats that I uh, have have issues with. But at the same time, better Andrew Cuomo sitting in that office when you have and it's a function of having a Democratic controlled uh, state assembly and Senate. I'm I'm glad that it's Cuomo as opposed to uh, whoever the last Republican. Tacky. Yeah, tacky. I'm, I'm tacky, but you know, whoever the, the guy who carried the baseball bat, whatever those oh, Carl, Carl Pal, uh, Palladino, who yeah. was the test case for Trump, by the way. But, but the point being is that I don't have to like Andrew Cuomo sure. to realize that there are pressures, that there are pressures on Cuomo that are not there on Carl Palladino. Yeah. And he that of his constituencies and where his base comes from, even if even if Ken Langone comes in and dumps a bunch of money in his lap, Cuomo still has to rely on some level to people on his left. And there are certain things where he makes a calculation and it's easier for him to do this than to do something else. And so he does it. And the implications of having voter uh, motor registration in this country, automatic registration is, is going to be big because it's going to build incrementally upon power, and that power is going to ultimately bring us reforms that we want. And, and it's also, I mean, I remember when we were arguing over the IDC and, and the IDC has but was in existence in different forms, didn't have the name the IDC at one point. It's been um, for a decade, right? And I mean, Emma, you remember we were at TYT and I think like you were present. I don't think I'm airing anything, but there, you know, I was arguing with uh, editors about whether or not this is something people would be interested in. And, you know, it's, it's that kind of gritty work, what, like watching the mechanics and getting people excited about something that could be significant in their lives. He wouldn't have been able to do this if it wasn't embarrassing for him. Everything about Cuomo is like he doesn't want to appear not as a progressive. He, I mean, obviously, he's not progressive, but he used the, I, the IDC to block legislation so he didn't have to veto legislation that you know, he, it would look bad if he vetoed. And now, especially if he's in the mix um, with, with as attorney general, like how great is it going to look for him to veto automatic voter registration in New York? So he had no choice. And that's, 
organizing. That was 10 years of organizing. That was tactical organizing. That was coalition building. That was educating voters about this like crazy thing that was happening in their own state that most people weren't even aware of. It takes a lot of work. Emma, were you talking? You're muted, I think. No, I'm, oh, am I muted? You were, I think you were a second ago. You said something. Oh, um, no, no, no. I mean, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, I think uh, the harder answer is not the one that a lot of people want, but I think you bringing up National Nurses United and the caller before was super key because that's the way that you build coalitions and build pressure internally in, in ways that people don't fully understand so that an opportune moment where you can strike and get Medicare for all into the national consciousness. Um, and and there, there was a, a time where maybe like say Bernie was president, right? This would have been perfect, like this kind of push to get a Medicare for all floor vote if Pelosi wasn't bringing it up. But um, the reality is that now Biden's going to be president. And he doesn't believe in Medicare for all. Although, yeah, we've 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 talked about this to death. So uh, meanwhile, you guys are talking about all this stuff and uh, Pete Hegseth and Brian Kilmeade are on to you and your nefarious plot. And that is to reach it <laughs> by allowing people to uh, eat during a pandemic. This is clip number four. Hollywood Boulevard struggles amid pandemic, 75% is boarded up. And that is emblematic, Brian, of across the country, communities that have faced these Democrat-driven, non-science-driven at this point, lockdowns that are arbitrary, are forcing people to close. Yet we're supposed to applaud Nancy and her $600,000 or $600 in crumbs that will arrive next week. Uh, as some sort of a solution. It is exactly how Democrats want top-down relief to work, and it doesn't work. Pete, you know what I worry about more, uh, more than anything else? Their intention is not to keep people safe. Their intention is not to beat the pandemic. Exactly. Their intention is to gain a uh, legitimate control and maybe uh, force mm -hmm. the remake of these states and the country uh, little by little. I just don't understand the wisdom of, of governing a state and not letting people work through it, provide the freedoms uh, to never survive and make their own decisions. I was out in L.A. three weeks ago to do that Jim Gray special. I had to drive around 40 minutes to find a place to have breakfast, and it was in the parking lot, and there was a sense they were going to get shut down any minute between two hotels. Unbelievable. Uh, okay. I had to drive 40 minutes to get <laughs> in L.A.? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> oh my god think about the people waiting in line for uh in their cars in those long food lines uh, well, the freedoms to survive about that. <laughs> this is the new rhetorical thing that they're doing and i'm noticing it and josh hawley was smart enough to get ahead of it for his presidential run yep it's all nancy's fault that you're getting six hundred dollars uh obviously the democrats stated position was they wanted twelve hundred dollar checks nancy pelosi ostensibly was in favor of that but then she goes on the House floor yesterday and says $600 should be enough, basically feeding into the Republican framing about this. And they're just going to run with it. They're going to claim that Nancy Pelosi is not giving you enough that, oh, $600. I mean, that's what they were saying there. It's crumbs, basically. That's that's. Um, well, Mark Warner was saying the same thing before that, the few days leading up to it, too. Right. I mean, when is there going to be some sort of punishment for these people right. for that? I mean, obviously, <laughs> you know, it's a rhetorical question. No, no, no. But uh, but the the point is, is that Republicans and, and conservative commentators, they don't need to be tethered to reality here, even though more Democrats were advocating for stimulus checks. There was one Republican in the Senate who was they are going to tie the lack of robust relief to the Democratic Party and try to punish Biden with it in 2022. And Fox and Friends is already on board. Yeah. And, and like I said earlier, you know, that AP report, you know, it's just the AP doing like a, you know, bottom of the hour news report on a radio station. But when they just categorize it as, you know, the uh, the uh, Congress has been arguing for, you know, nine months, and they finally have agreed to this. They're not telling us anything about the dynamic that's there. Now, with that said, like, you know, Pelosi's uh, and, and Warner's, they're they're their maniacal desire to sort of like appease um, some, I don't know, centrist, uh, you know, uh, beltway coalition. Like it, it would cost them nothing yeah. to say this is insufficient. We needed more. This is all the Republicans would give the American public. And so we said, yes, 
We fought for it, and this is all they would give. I mean, that's all you need to say. Well, I mean, at least need, from a political standpoint. Yeah. Um, and, and you need that messaging going into Georgia. Yeah. Well, that, the, the, that was why McConnell wanted this bill to begin with, is for relief to come and for them to be able to say that they agreed to something. So why, with Georgia on the horizon, would Pelosi not go take to the bully pulpit and say? Elect John Ossoff, elect right. Raphael Warnock, and we will be able to get more to the American public because that's what they need. Yeah. We're, we we did as much as we could with this intractable Mitch McConnell Republican led Senate. I mean, it's this is all sort of like, basic you know, politics. basic policy yeah. themes, and and you I know, even understand like even even on their own terms, even with the most cynical perspective I have about Nancy Pelosi, I still can't understand like why doesn't she have the ability just to simply rhetorically say this stuff, even if it's just paying lip service? Yes. You know, it'd be interesting. I mean, uh, idea for Nancy Pelosi and the, and the Dems, how many of, of, of their members have really large followings on, on I mean, whether the, obviously the progressives do in the squad, but like some of these folks, I mean, have significant followings on social media. What would it take for her to say, do a video, talk to your constituents and talk about this? You know, if, if you had 60 members suddenly doing videos and on this messaging, I mean, not only would it penetrate the the left media and CNN, I think it would be covered on on Fox and how many of them go on Fox News. I mean, there's just like no messaging apparatus yeah. whatsoever in the Democratic caucus. It's weird. Well, I think, you know, AOC tries to fill that void with some of her instructional videos like on Instagram or something like that. But Sam has said, and, and I think it's a good point, buttering you up here about the... Uh, <laughs> Uh, He's like okay. Sam Frazel. <laughs> you're you're going to get a vacation in just a day or two. Yeah. What about me? I just gave you a compliment too. Oh, nice. Chop liver. <laughs> um, but uh, the, Sam keeps talking about how Democrats clearly do not want to nationalize this Georgia race. And um, I, I, I think that's part of it, right? Is that they, they don't want people like AOC or squad members involved in or nancy pelosi for that matter pelosi who is somehow linked with them right and so pelosi like always is playing scared not trying to give republicans any father because she just doesn't engage in politics ever so it doesn't matter there's always a new excuse now it's the georgia runoff so i won't attack republicans oh i'm not going to agree to this because uh the the presidential election is coming up and now we have to you know play prevent defense all the time so uh, I, I do think it's a smart strategy not to nationalize the race. I still think you can call out Republicans in a Georgia runoff when the key issue is the stimulus for them wanting to make it less than it was. And this was all that they were able to get. All right. I want to change uh, gears here. I, I'm going to start by saying this. I am afraid, and we're going to do it anyways, but I'm going to say like that I am afraid that this is some type of rat F operation or this is some type of honeypot. I'm not quite sure. Okay. But there was a video put out by Prager U. <laughs> uh, the Robert E. Lee statue has been removed from the Capitol and it is being put in a museum in Virginia. That's persecution. And the Prager U did a video ostensibly to argue why Robert E. Lee deserves a statue they don't say it deserves to be in the Capitol and the statue is not being destroyed. It's just being put into a museum. And I am very nervous that there is something embedded in this video. It's like either a copyright thing or it's like, you know, it's some type of this is a trap because it is impossible for me to believe that they put out this video that purports to argue why Robert Lee E. Lee deserves a statue and they have made a compelling case that not only should this statue not be put into a museum that it should be ground to a pulp and whatever material it is made out of i'm not quite clear that should be used in the furtherance of of maybe some other statue like i don't know um uh, an ant trump <laughs> no but here is the video uh and this is uh, this is stunning who was Robert E. Lee? Oh my gosh. Well, look at how they denigrated his statue. Oh Statues of great historical figures like Robert E. Lee are being torn down across America. Here are some facts about Lee that remind us why his statue should remain. 
Robert E. Lee was connected to George Washington through his father, Light Horse Harry Lee, Washington's cavalry commander, and his wife, Martha Washington's great uh, we're gonna go through all these okay. genealogy. Robert E. Lee. Why should he have a statue? Reason number one: his dad was connected to George Washington uh, in the military. We need to honestly. Everyone, George Washington's second cousins, or else, right? That's a sort of like blood lineage fixation that Mark Twain was roasting the South for. Yes. <laughs> yes. Also, like, what percentage do you think of military people? Uh, in the 1800s, didn't have a relative who was in right. some way associated with George Washington's army. Yeah, the, the tree was a lot smaller back then. Right. I mean, but okay. The, the number of black people that should have uh, statues for being related to Jefferson, for instance. Right, exactly. exactly. <laughs> Let's continue here because we got a lot to It gets to cover. so much worse. And our- Lee's home at Arlington House was just 10 miles from Washington's Mount Vernon. Oh my God. Yes. Location, it location, location. Of Arlington <laughs> National Cemetery. After 30 years of military service, Lee led U.S. Marines to crush the attempted slave rebellion by radical abolitionist Whoa. John Brown in Whoa. October 1850. Uh, and there you go. 21 co conspirators <laughs> had seized a federal armory, and all of no. them were killed or captured, including John Brown who was tried and hanged for treason. Okay, yeah, Lee they're Dean- bragging about that? Yeah. <laughs> the first they, they open with, he lived in a 10-mile radius from George's <laughs> old house. Okay, yep, everybody. Uh, Boom. Done. Boom. Yeah. Everybody needs a statue in that area. <laughs> and the attempt crushing of the slave. Not attempted. They oh, crushed, they crushed the, the attempted, attempted slave rebellion. That's what I meant to say. They crushed it. And they, and they, and they, they made sure they annihilated everyone. And then they try and salvage this. Okay, you ready for this? They salvage it by saying that that John Brown was uh, hung for treason. treason. I want you to keep that in the back of your mind. He was treasonous at the time <laughs> because he was trying to liberate slaves. But the idea of treason must be really bad when you're talking about the pantheon <laughs> Of, of America at that time. You know, the crushing of the slave re- slave re- slave rebellion is listed as a positive yeah. piece of his resume by Prager U in the year 2020. And, and why? Because How? it's treasonous. Yeah, can't do treason. Can't do treason. Treason's bad, even if it's- For an- any reason. Liberating the slaves, it's so bad even that you should get it. Even if you're trying to leave the British Empire. Now, I don't want to have a spoiler alert, but remember, here's just a little clue. Robert E. Lee, general in the rebellious Confederacy. But that's right. Oh, God. Oh, God. Right. That was so good. <laughs> Slavery, a moral and political evil in any country, but considered it a greater evil to the white man than to the black race, since what? blacks are immeasurably better off here than in Africa. Pause it. Pause what it. on earth? why you need a statue to Robert E. Lee is because he knew that slavery was bad, but it was bad because of what it did to the white man. What people. What the I have the rest of that quote hell? also. It's so like, uh, the rest of the rest. Well, I'll just read it here. Um, uh, the blacks are immeasurably better off here than in Africa, morally, socially, and physically. The painful discipline they're undergoing is necessary for their instruction as a race. And I hope, uh, will prepare and lead them to better things. How long their subjugation may be necessary is known and ordered by a wise, merciful providence. Their emancipation will sooner result from the mild and melting influence of Christianity than the storms and tempests of fiery controversy. Dave, you didn't have to read that whole thing. I would have built a statue for that guy. <laughs> said they were better off, uh, uh, you know, than in Africa. I didn't even need the. What is this being normalized right now? How? Like the Mississippi burning, like the way it, that, like the story of slavery, uh, the story of racial injustice, the real victim is the white man in this right. one, or the real center of attention needs to be the white I man. I mean, is there, like, like, do people understand now why, like, I'm afraid that this video isn't somehow, like, gonna, it's like, it's like, it's going to blow up our channel, yeah. like, like it's literally, like, all right, like, like guys. some type of, like, plot? Yeah, like, they've been doing it and asking celebrities to accidentally say, uh, like, alt-right phrases on their uh, cameo accounts, so that's kind of maybe what I, PragerU is goading us I'm into. starting to think that, like, wow. 
the onion put this out and it's a fake Prager view video. Okay. But go backwards, play through this because I mean, that is really, I mean, that is, uh, if you're not convinced that Robert Lee, Lee needs a statue now, I don't know when you're going to be, but go backwards just a little bit and then play for it. Lee deemed slavery a moral and political evil in any country, but considered it a greater evil to the white man than to the black race, since blacks are immeasurably better off here than in Africa. Opposing secession, Lee foresaw no greater calamity for the country than a dissolution of the Union. Pause it. But when Virginia pause it, pause seceded... Pause it. Pause it. Remember what we talked about before about the treason thing? Keep that in the forefront of your mind. That's why it was okay. Why Lee should get a statue for quashing this slave rebellion, right? Because it's treasonous. And I just stressed the bit about him being ambivalent about slavery. And, <laughs> and, and, and now knows Supposedly. he thinks secession is the worst thing that could happen to the country. So treason, secession, these are bad things. And his fighting against it is exactly why we should give him a statue, except for in this narrow case. <laughs> Post vote, Lee resigned his commission. Despite offers to command Union forces, Lee opted to organize the defense of his native state. Native After four state. years as Confederate commander, Lee became an icon of reconciliation what? upon his surrender. As president of Virginia's Washington College, he favored education for freed slaves but opposed their right to vote. Of course. Yeah, well, so it was, it was just bartering. Lee died from a stroke in 1870 and is buried Good. beneath Lee Chapel in what's now Washington and Lee Bye. University. His legendary warhorse, Traveler, rests in a plot nearby. Oh my, oh, god. oh my god more more he has more respect for his war horse than he has for the slaves that he doesn't want to give the vote to are you this is insane listen i think anybody in this country who has a stroke <laughs> and has their horse buried next to them <laughs> deserves a statue you have to have lived in a 10 mile radius of a particular <laughs> particularly famous figure exactly yeah um i love how he's kind of like the mitt romney of slavery like he'll give lip service and say i think slavery is kind of wrong but here's all the reasons i'm going to uphold it like maybe commit treason and, and start a war or participate in a war why wasn't he committed i mean a, 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 a traitor why wasn't any treason yeah he was a traitor yes the lead traitor yes. the lead traitor and yet they're the getting lead their high horse obviously buried next to you that's as custom I'm getting up on their high horse about uh, uh, uh about treason it's just unbelievable to me can i just say what i think this is about it's about prager you attracting white supremacists to their thanks content. matt <laughs> thank you matt just to spell that out for people honestly there's only two answers here one is it's about attracting white supremacists Two is this is a parody account or there's a mole inside or, or there's just like Michael Medved supposedly wrote it. And it's quite possible that maybe he really deep down hates Robert E. Lee and does not want that statue or or maybe he's invested it in like the Virginia Museum that it's in. And he's looking for a bump on that. I don't know. Or maybe it, if you play that hip hop music they're using backwards, it'll send a secret message and. <laughs> And say actually we think Robert E. Lee's bad. Actually, we think he's bad. That is just nuts. I mean, that that is just that is just nuts. Like spy kids. Also, Washington and Lee University. I had no idea it was named after Robert E. Lee. I know. Who's I know. that name, guys. Oh yeah. I kind Whoa. of looked down upon people I, I I was acquaintances with that went there because of that, which is unfair. But well, there's a lot of schools you could do that with. Right? I know. I know. Calling from a nine one five area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Oh jeez, look at the time. This is the final call of the day, hey. folks. Howdy, y'all. Hey, what's happening? Who's this? this Where are you calling from? This is Desert Day calling from El Paso, Texas. It's who? A little hard to hear. Desert Dave. Can Desert you Dave, can you can you get up on your phone? Are you on speakerphone or something? Yeah, I am. Here, let me try to fix it. Can you hear me better now? Yeah, go ahead. All right. So first of all, I just like to say I'm a huge fan of the show. Know me. I live for your jazz snaps. And uh, <laughs> you're like the lefty father we all wish we had. Oh. I can imagine you whenever the revolution starts saying, "Hey, y'all can't go to the revolution because 
Target's closed and you won't be able to reapply any sunscreen and you won't be able to stay hydrated. So for that, I thank you all very much. Well, you're, you're welcome, I think. <laughs> so my main point of discussion is um, the whole Medicare for all argument. And, you know, I'm not a fan of Jimmy Dore. I'm much more of a fan of the ecosystem that you built. Huge fan of, of No Means Show. Was a huge fan of Michael's show as well. So I love I love that entire community that you have. That being said, I really think it is a good idea for us to bring up that Medicare for all for a vote. And I've got a few, uh, I'd like to discuss it with you guys and see what y'all think about it. I've heard a lot of the discourse that y'all have mentioned. And my main points are that uh, right now, ACA has never been weaker. Trump has been trying to completely do away with it. And Joe Biden, we know that he's going to rebuild it. So if we don't attack it from now, it's going to be really, really tough to do in the future. And the third point is that um, right now in a pandemic, a lot of people are losing their, their health insurance. I lost mine whenever I lost my job a few months ago. And because of that, I think we do have a really, really strong case to make the point that we deserve Medicare for all as citizens of the country and not just as employees. And if we're able to really put it there as a vote, then we could have all of the people who are for it that we know have co-sponsored it, get on the floor, make their point about it. And whenever it does get knocked down, which we know, this could incite that direct action that Jamie always talks about. And we could leverage that in order to really make these protests and hold our individual representatives accountable and try to force them or kick them out in the next two years. And in that way, I see it sort of like tacking and sailing where we use the inside outside strategy that Lula da Silva was so famous for effectively utilizing in order to really I, build that coalition let, on the inside and outside. Let me just see if I understand uh, the chain of events that happened. Like, look, and, and, and again, I just want to stipulate that um, I think it was, um, I think the idea of, of leveraging the vote has value. Uh, leveraging the vote for Pelosi has value, okay? Uh, but if I understand what you're saying here is what's going to happen is this vote's going to come to the floor. Now, presumably what has to happen is 10 uh, I think it's approximately, it depends on how many people show up. All right. The way that the voting works right. is this, you need to get the majority of votes for the speaker of named votes. So for instance, the progressives who go there, they, and they have to go because if they don't go, it's still just a majority of named votes. So 10 progressives could not show up in Congress and it would still be, I mean, well, it would be close there. Let's say nine could not show up in Congress. And if everybody else in the Democratic and the Republican caucus showed up, I think there'd be one more vote uh, for Nancy Pelosi. So they need to show up. They cannot vote present because if they vote present, they still have the same uh, dynamic. It's as if they're not there. They right. need to vote for somebody else. Let's say they vote for Noam Chomsky. All right. Then it it's goes adjusting. back. It, there's no winner because nobody gets the majority of the voting named votes, goes back to the caucus. They say, we demand a vote on Medicare for all. Okay, you'll get that vote. Incidentally, all of you, you will never get a committee ship. You don't ever, we're going to nail you on everything. But okay, you're going to get your vote. Then the vote comes back. The full house votes on Medicare for all. The, the vote ends up being uh, approximately 315 to uh, 118, whatever it is, 305 to 118. I don't know how many, you know, 435, but we have some that it might be extant. So, it's, so Medicare for All, assuming every single one of the, uh, the co-sponsors of the bill vote for it, it loses by 300 votes. Then, right. according to the plan, the people, who, the Democrats who voted against Medicare for all, who had already not co-sponsored the bill, that list gets disseminated. 
there are, I don't know, uh, 200 districts, I mean, 110 districts, let's just say off the top of my head, 100 uh, districts, let's call it 100 districts, where uh, Democrats voted against Medicare for all. And two years from now, that vote, because people are going to organize against it, is going to vote those Democrats out and a, a Democrat who supported Medicare for all in. Um, and that's and now that's the upside of this. Have I got that right? I would I would make a few a few different alterations to that. Medicare for all is important not only to Democrats, but it's also important to Republicans. By doing this, we really say this is more of a less of a nonpartisan. We make it more of a nonpartisan issue. OK, so so but I mean, in terms of change, in there. there's going to be Republican organizations who are going to primary Republican lawmakers who don't do Medicare for all. Is that what you're suggesting? I'm suggesting that we put it in the national consciousness, like Bernie Sanders did for us in 2016. Bernie like Sanders did it. It is. It's the most popular piece of legislation in the world that has absolutely zero path right now in Congress. It's not because it's not because Republican voters don't want to vote for it. I don't want to refute it. I just want to look at yeah. the best case scenario. I'm just trying to tease out how this actually physically works and the benefit that comes from it. And as Sam says, in this best case scenario, there will be more retaliation well, against those members that organize it. Okay. Yeah. Let's just, I mean, I'm just going through this. I'm but just going the through trade-off. Right. That is the trade off. Um, I would say we can't be afraid of that retaliation. Well, no, I know, I know. Obama couldn't get anything done because they ran against Obamacare, his one piece of legislation. For, so, for, I want to I just keep this focused here. Okay. I think that is focused. Keep out the re- retaliation for a moment. Like that is is that the best scenario? That so I've I've had several debates with my friends. I was actually on your side of saying we should. No, no, I don't. You don't need to, to give me the filler. I'm just trying to look okay. at this I, thing. I in, think that's in its shiniest I do think that's look. The best option. Okay. I think that's well, the that, best. Well, that so in that scenario, and so now in terms of cost, I know you're not afraid of it. I'm not afraid of it either. The cost is that you inhibit the ability of our greatest allies in the House to negotiate for anything, to build a coalition with anybody. At best, maybe they voted for Hakeem Jeffries or Noam Chomsky or whomever for speaker. Eventually they give in. This vote happens. It gets slaughtered, right? Three to one in the Congress and you have diminished the power of the uh, progressives on this very, on this issue. And, and ostensibly it's going to get us what? Well, two points about that. Every representative, everyone who went up for election that supported Medicare for all won their seat. You guys have mentioned that on the show several times. Also, on Nomi's last show, she mentioned that AOC lost her committee chair on the uh, energy committee. Well, she, she didn't, didn't lose it. it. She never well, had it. She didn't it. get it. Yeah. Well, she did lose the vote. She, she, she did. Lost, there was a vote. She wasn't on the, uh, on the, uh, on the committee. But part of that so she was. She lost the vote. But, but see, she lost the vote because the other candidate or the other person who was able to get that position leveraged her vote where she said publicly i'm not in support of nancy pelosi no, you're sequencing this wrong she said that I am, she said I am, that but I, I she said that two or three years she me. voted against nancy pelosi um uh two years ago but what happened in this instance is you had a lot of people who were mad at aoc for primarying republicans this was their i mean primary democrats this was them disciplining aoc the issue of her uh, of, of Rice said it. Yes, the issue of Rice not voting for Nancy Pelosi is not why this happened. This happened because AOC was being disciplined, and do you know who had her back? Nobody. And and the point is that the point is that she will be disciplined further, and she saw those primary endorsements as an intelligent measured way to leverage her power not one progressive lawmaker right now thinks this is an an intelligent way to leverage their power when they see other 
openings because there's a reason that Mitch McConnell wanted to bring Medicare for all for a vote in the Senate. And he talked about that publicly. And the reason was but the reason Mm -hmm. was was because he knew that a vote would sap the the legislation, the idea behind Medicare for all of its power. And now progressives ostensibly, I mean, I know you are coming in good faith, but but uh, yes, I, I should take that back. A lot of good progressives are arguing for this. And I disagree because I don't think it is strategic. And, you know, Eric Levitz wrote in his piece today, and I think it's just a really great point that the the morality of a uh, an idea has to be equated with or has to be seen in, a, in uh, balance with its practicality or its likeliness to succeed in a current moment. And a lot of that can be from outside pressure and you can change things. But right now, it's not within the realm of possibility because progressives lost on the presidential level and did not make as many gains as they could have. There is no leverage. And so it... Yeah. What all it does is open the door for further retaliation just, again. Right. It's just slamming your head against the wall or slamming the remote as Sam like has been using it. it all it does exhausting yourself. Exhaust. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to say, like, that's the thing is, like, if there was a union involved in this, like I, I'm hearing way too much about protests and not that's enough right. about strikes. You're not going to change this level with protests. I don't think. Maybe I'm wrong, but if that's a theory, I think we should be explicit about that, and I think it uh, is bare scrutiny. Can I can I mention something real quick? You know, Jane McAlevey comes on your show a lot and my show, and and I happen to pull up her book. If you guys haven't seen it, I have it right here. I'm going to read one little part at the back because she's been talking about this for years. And there's one line it's just on the cover of the book. On the cover, it says that a strategy today's progressives have mostly abandoned, meaning um, the power. Okay, she says she makes a compelling argument that great social movements of pressure in previous eras gained their power from mass organizing, a strategy today's progressives have mostly abandoned in favor of shallow mobilization or advocacy. So in this book, if you guys want to know how you there are no shortcuts, it's called no shortcuts for a reason. It's people are like Jimmy Dore has elevated this in a way that's never been done before. That's just not true. The real organizing, as Matcha says, NNU really pressured lawmakers to sign on to that bill really pressured through a public campaign. They literally ran a conference on this, you know, the people's summit on Medicare for all, making it a key issue of Bernie Sanders's campaign. So it would become the most popular issue in America. But Jimmy Dore hasn't been able to take it through the legislative door. That has to come through real strategic alliances and pressuring the Democrats who, you know, unfortunately, are, are, are more tied to the institutional politics than they are to the movement politics. And I think that's why unions, like you just said, Matt, are, are key to this fight. Look, I appreciate the call. And I think that, like, you know, the um, uh, like I say, I think there was value in trying to leverage something from uh, Nancy Pelosi's vote. But I have a feeling that those things that should have been leveraged were more about, like, committee positions or some type of structural reform that is going to give uh, the progressive, the progressives in Congress, slightly more power so that when this issue is more ripe, I mean, look, we just elected a president who also won the Democratic primary by saying that even if Congress was to bring him Medicare for all, he would veto, veto it. And let me ask That's you, so right. here's the thing. And he did this in the midst of a pandemic. And That's right. And, and, and he did it in the midst of the pandemic when, like, the concern about the pandemic was at its peak. The argument that a losing vote in Congress, and this is the best case scenario, a losing vote three to one is somehow going to create some type of spontaneous wildfire that is going to sweep Congre- you know, congressional candidates out in two years from now and put in uh, progressives. I just don't, it's like, I like it's, it, that's, I, I don't see how that happens. The only thing I can Result. see is that it's basically the narrative becomes, this is wildly unpopular in Congress and you have now undercut and debilitated uh, the progressive um, um, uh, uh, legislators who are closest to you because they have shown a, that they, they're weak and they have been then marginalized in their um in their uh uh in their 
in their uh, what do you call it in their in their own um, in their own caucus. And so that going, mm-hmm. but but going I, along that point, there's always a discussion if politics is downstream from culture or if culture is downstream from politics. Look, I don't care about JD. I'm, I'm now, I have never seen one of his shows until last well, week. What is it? Okay, that's and fine. But honestly, like, we don't have to t- bring him up. But what do you, okay, so what, okay. what? My point is this. My point is this. Culture is now forcing politics to put up the vote. Vote. Wait, the vote will happen. What culture? And it will fail, which will incite There's the There's 22,000 people. Really oh, easily, and then it'll incite that motion back dude, into the political sphere. Dude, there's 22,000 people who signed a petition. The culture you're talking about is a very narrow culture on Twitter. Okay. But even then, it's still the most popular. If the most popular, as as Sam just said, if if they were able to say that they were going to veto it, the reason why Joe Biden was able to say that that was a well thought out thing. They, he wouldn't take that risk if he didn't know that the institutions in which this thing are to get passed would not allow it. He wouldn't have said that. And of course, it works to capital's advantage and his own advantage. But this is the most popular piece of legislation. It's like Donald Trump taking on the postal workers. The most popular agency is the post postal's off post office. So that's culture. But clearly the culture is not affecting the institutions. And that only happens through very tactical organizing. And if it takes three years, look how much effort Obama put into Obamacare. Right. He they did massive campaigns on this. And of course, it's a flawed uh, piece of legislation. But then it became the right wing's obsession. And, you know, when I say obviously Obama is a neoliberal, but I say that there was a lot of other work that he could have gotten past that he wasn't able to get past because it became the obsession that in Benghazi uh, of the Republicans. And so, I, I, you know, do we want to lose our ability to get rent relief immediately tomorrow, literally tomorrow? Do we want to lose our ability to raise the minimum wage, which is on the table right now, as Amma says, and many other things that are immediately within our grasp because we want to draw this out for three years because it will take that long to pass. That's just how legislation moves. It's not, you know, even if we elect a new Congress full of progressives, that'll still be in three years. Um, All right. Well, that's the, you know, I wanted to have a, uh, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to, I invited, um, I invited one person on who's been advocating this and uh, never heard back. I don't know. Maybe uh, maybe they didn't hear. Um, they didn't they didn't see it. But um, uh, but, you know, I, my feeling is ultimately is like, you know, fine. I mean, it like the the it is the to the extent that the damage has been done. I think the damage has been done. It's been used as a cudgel to undercut the support of the most progressive people in, uh, in, in, in the Congress uh, with, I think, a fairly narrow slice of, but very loud slice of, of the internet. And, you know, the upshot is, it does not appear to me that they're going to uh, force this vote. Um, I think like the, uh, the, the, uh, the ground has been sort of, I think, you know, um, uh, farmed enough at this point that there's no leveraging of it in any respect. Um, it's disempowered without a doubt. You know, you want to talk about the Henry Cuellars and the, and the ones who voted against uh, yep. AOP. They're laughing at this. Yes. They're loving this. Notice and, how Neera Tannen hasn't criticized any of these people that she loves to criticize normally. I mean, she's I, like, let them eat themselves. She's got her, uh, she's got her, uh, she's got her, her, but, but I think they're, they're, I mean, of, that group. of course they're enjoying this. And so, um, uh, the, of course they're enjoying, you know, the, the, this disempowering the thing. And that's, and I think, you know, look, I don't know uh, everybody's intentions. I don't know that you can divine it. I can look back at past comments from uh, uh, from some people who are looking to disempower these people and and to create a certain uh, cynicism by you know sort of creating expectations that are unreasonable. But uh, and it's not even a question of unreasonable. It's just it doesn't make sense. Like you can't you know you can you can map it out this way, and I just don't know uh, where that that leads you. I think there are asks that you can that you can ask that might be helpful, but. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm suspicious of it, but you know, fine, go. I, you know, if you need, let me put it this way. 
if somebody out there feels like they need a full-throated endorsement for the majority report for a a pressure campaign on you know uh to hit this um uh domino to hit that domino to have that domino and we hold that position of of power then you know (laughs) I, I'm expecting a, you know, like a, a, a phone call is to explain to me how this is supposed to work. Uh, but I, I don't think that we do. So it is what it is. Um, all right. We're done with phone calls. That was a good call, though. I'm glad that he called in coming from that perspective. I, I, I Like I say, I would have liked to have this conversation with um, with someone who's been more uh, public about uh, uh, bringing it up, but I haven't heard back anything still open to it and maybe maybe they'll they'll find that i i sent uh that kind of message but uh i don't know i'm not gonna i'm not gonna interpret it in any way uh but let's go to a couple more ims and then we'll get out of here uh noog wrangler word on the street is that nomi's twitch channel is getting a sub button soon when is it your turn sam we got to work on that. I, I, what? What? I didn't even know this. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, Cuck Stofi, how many heavy hitters like Emma Viglin does Jank have to give a platform to make up for giving us not only Dave Rubin, but Jimmy Dore? Love you, Emma. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> and Michael Tracy, don't forget. Can Matt read me while flying yeah, over so. the Dakotas? Uh, well, if you become a patron of uh, Literary Hangover, I read three quarters of a book for patrons. I need to finish it maybe this winter. But uh, yeah, Hope Leslie by Catherine Marie Sedgwick. Um, Jude from Connecticut did a sociological experiment mistake and looked at the chat scroll from a door live stream. Lots of anti <laughs> pro Trump. See, now Jimmy knows how Trump feels and pro Rand Paul rhetoric makes you think about the demographic of congressional representative he's rallying against and why. Uh, Craven James, if my knowledge of Christmas media is correct, I'm pretty sure Rand Paul should be expecting a visit from Three Spirits any night now. <laughs> At least this time it's not his neighbor. Brindag, can someone explain to me like I'm five, why does every bill have to include like 10 million unrelated things? COVID relief, Israel, climate change. Like why can't out we write a bill about one thing at a time? Because those things couldn't pass otherwise. You gotta sneak Medicare for all into some other bill. Like what can we... That's like the, the the trick. Like where where can we withhold our our power on one of the bills that they want? Maybe the bill military budget, which pretty much everybody votes for anyways, and use Medicare for all and sneak it in that way. Yeah. The well. And that's not realistic, guys. It's sort of well, it's not <laughs> in light of the failure in negotiations to evidence in this bill, should the argument devouring the left change to whether any demand is worth voting for Pelosi instead of insisting she step down? Frankly. I, I I am far more in favor of simply not voting for Nancy Pelosi yes. than I am for leveraging it for something that I think is ultimately going to hurt um, uh, that issue. Like, I think there's a very good argument of like, just don't vote for Pelosi. Now, I don't know who you vote for, frankly, in this instance, right? Like, I don't know if... I don't know who you vote for. I, Hakeem Jeffries, I think, is uh, in some ways um, just as problematic as Pelosi because he's just going to adopt and get her entire infrastructure in terms of like the same networks of power are going to just he's he's number what three now in uh, Democratic leadership for a reason. He is her pick to become the next majority leader. And so I don't know if, I mean, frankly, I feel like a guy like Tim Ryan is a much more effective foil for the progressives mm-hmm. in that, but I don't know how you do that. Like, I don't know how you, 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 um, you manage that. And it's clear that um, AOC doesn't have at least support from the, the, the 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 committee chairs and whatnot who have um you know that, that there's a 50 seat um essentially committee that determines who gets what chairs and um despite the fact that she had the entire new york delegation endorsing her and rice had didn't even have um uh, nadler's endorsement 
she still lost. So, I mean, I think like, you know, but I, I have no problem with that, with a voting down Pelosi. I think that's a much better thing. Oh, shoot. It's, all right. We got to get out of here. Nomi's got a show. All right. Uh, uh, yeah. to- I, even, I even didn't even notice <laughs> Sam, if you're interested in learning just, more about the goings on in the uh, PNW this summer, Robert Evans would be a great interview guest. Uh, we will check it out. Chris Lepaco, how come money can't be created out of thin air when it disappears into thin air all the time? Jeff Bezos says an elk have more money than could ever be hoped and spend it in a lifetime. Indeed. All right. The final I am of the day. Oh, all right. So we go. Uh, is there any weight to the thought that the Democratic Party is old and top heavy? Therefore, if the progressive movement keeps chipping away at the foundation of the party, it will crumble or die. And if we have our shit together, they'll be we'll be there to catch it. Time to start on the 2021 local elections. Keep fighting left is best. I'm, I'm not sure I understand what you're talking about, but um, I do think that there's a generation that is blocking significant change. And even like to get a version of Hakeem Jeffries, he at the very least has a sort of a partisan instinct that I think is different from Pelosi uh, because he's grown up or been, you know, in a different era. Um, I don't know if his politics are necessarily better, but I think he's better at practicing them. Uh, and I'm not sure if that works. Uh, his base is different, too. I mean, I, I think that's one thing to keep in mind with that generation. Um you know, in their like the the I, I guess your age, Sam, like the Cory Book, Bookers, the Kamala Harris's, etc. Their futures are tethered to us, whereas Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer. I agree. All right, uh, check out Nomi's show. Following this one, go to YouTube.com/slash no, the Nomi Key Show, and see you tomorrow, Bye guys. Thanks. Bye, guys. Thank you. It might take all the strength I got. To get to where I want But I know somehow I'm gonna get there I wasn't looking when I just got caught Between the truth and the light bar